Ah. So did someone give you the motion to make me, you can move, just, I'm, So I'd like to, uh, it's just after 1.30, we have quorum, we can call the meeting to order. If I can ask, in the absence of our chair, Councillor Sohi, uh, if I can ask for a motion from one of my committee members to make me the presiding chair, please. Happy to move that motion to make Michael Walters the presiding chair of today's meeting. I thought you were vice chair. Yes. Well, I am vice chair, but you still require the motion. Is that right? How silly is that? <laughs> we'll, vote, we'll vote on that later, <laughs> on the silliness of that. But, but for now, thank you. Motion, car motion carried. Okay. Uh, so can I have a motion to approve the agenda with uh, changes, please? Uh, so moved. Uh, adoption of the agenda of June 5, Transportation Committee. Okay. That would be the with the change in the with the uh, changes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. All in favor? Okay. Motion carried. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the minutes uh, from the May twenty first, two thousand and fourteen Transportation Committee meeting, please? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Esslinger. Any comments? All in favor? Minutes are passed. Are there any protocol items? Seeing none. Uh, do we have requests to speak? We can have a motion for speakers. If we could select the Oh, items. sorry, I missed that. Select items. <sighs> it's not a flawless performance. The uh, uh, select items for debate, please. Anyone? I'm here. We have. Oh, sorry. Councillor Esslinger was first, and then Councillor Anderson. I have 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, and 6.6. Oops. Okay. And I'll, and I'll add 7.1 because we have a speaker. Okay. So. I'll move okay. 6.5 and 6.7. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Okay. Sorry, Madam Clerk. And 5.1. And 5.1. And 5.1. All right. And before we go to uh, what we've done so far, any requests to speak? Councilor Esslinger? We've got a motion on the floor to approve oh, 6567. Six, oh, okay. We'll move those items 651, uh, 65, six, six, and 67. Six, All in favor? Okay. That motion's carried. To read what we've passed and then yeah. Can you read back what we've passed, uh, Madam Clerk? Today, Transportation Committee has passed the following uh, items. Uh, item 5.1, uh, the due date has been revised to to be determined. 6.5, Arterial Network Intelligent Transportation Technology Initiatives and open tenders to, mil to heh, $20 million or greater has also passed. Thank you. And a request to speak, Councillor Esslinger, if you could move those. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to <clears throat> move that the following speakers in panels where appropriate would be able to speak. For 6.1, I have Christopher Chan, Elaine Solez, Conrad Norbert, Michael Fair, Lyle Falk, and Dion Buse. For 6.2, I have Lyle Falk, Elaine Solez. For 6.3, Peter Moore, Elaine Solez, Lyle Falk, for 6.4, Don Grimble, and for 7.1, Warren Champion. Okay, that motion is on the floor. All in favor of hearing from those speakers? Motion carried, thank you. Okay, so we'll move to uh, item 6.1, 2014 to 18 bike lane infrastructure plan. We could panel the, or we'll hear a report from the administration. Are there Question. any councillor inquiries? Oh, are there any councillor inquiries? I meant to say that, thanks. Uh, seeing none today, uh, we'll uh, move to report from administration on 6.1. You don't have any inquiries? Yeah. 
Is this one? Okay. All right. Phone call. Um, thank you, uh, Transportation Committee. My name is Tyler Golly. I'm with Sustainable Transportation, and uh, my colleague here, Michelle Shalafu, is with Public Engagement, and we'll be giving you the presentation today. Councillor Walters made a motion on February 5th of 2014. This uh, report and presentation respond to the first part of that motion, particularly or specifically about the 2014 to 2018 implementation plan for bicycle infrastructure, as well as recommendations for enhanced public engagement and strategies for uh, public education. There will be a subsequent report in fall of 2014 on the second part of the motion from February 5th regarding the evaluation of existing routes. Some highlights for you folks from the, uh, from the report. Um, in terms of the bicycle infra infrastructure implementation, and the plan for 2014 and 18, the main focus of that will be on major routes in the central areas and building and funding high quality infrastructure. Um, Michelle will be talking about the enhanced public engagement approaches that we'll be looking at, uh, specifically that will allow the public to have uh, more direct influence on decisions. And Michelle will also be presenting uh, regarding the uh, public education approaches and enhancements to fill some of the gaps that we have from our current program. There's really four types of infrastructure that we're looking at for 2014 to 2018 that I'll, will be part of this presentation. Uh, there's major routes, neighborhood routes, shared use paths, and then some support and safety infrastructure that we'll be including. So in terms of the, the major routes, our focus will be for 2014 to 18 will be on the high existing use areas that provide access to major destinations. These areas do have a, a history of collisions between vehicles and bicycles, and uh, we do get frequent requests. And we're looking at the high, high quality infrastructure for these areas due to the use. Um, sorry. This map shows the, the major routes that we're gonna be focusing on for 2014 to 2018, uh, obviously pending budget approval in, in the fall, that will be coming to you. Um, these routes will be coming to you with, with budgets as part of that. Um, and the locations of the routes that are shown here are from the Bicycle Transportation Plan. Michelle's gonna be talking about the public engagement approach. And really, this is the starting point from us, for us for, for consultation is what the bike plan says. But the first phase of that, of that uh, consultation will be looking at where the routes should be located to serve the demands in that area. The next type of infrastructure that we're looking at are neighborhood routes. These are uh, constructed as part of neighborhood renewal. Um, they don't typically or don't impact parking and, and travel lanes. Uh, a lot of the times it's just actually uh, bringing our current signed routes up to standards, so adding the share markings. And they really pr are there to help provide wayfinding guidance for cyclists through neighborhoods to connect to adjacent neighborhoods and to safer crossings of the major streets. So these are low volume roads that have uh, low speeds as well as vehicles. The other infrastructure that we'll be looking at are shared use paths. Um, a lot of these are built through roadway projects and LRT projects, but we also build some through the Active Transportation Capital Program, which is a composite program, uh, which will also be going to council for uh, as part of the capital budget debate or deliberations in the fall. And lastly, we do look at intersection safety improvements, um, providing and supplying monitoring equipment to, to continue to improve our data collection regarding cycling and, and pedestrians, as well as bicycle racks and bike corrals in support of uh, our major destination areas. We clearly heard uh, coming forward out of the last meeting that we need to change the way we t engage with the public on bike routes. We've ha taken that time to reflect since then on everything we've learned over the years, the things we've heard over the years. We've had an opportunity to meet with most of the councillors and some individuals. Uh, about their experiences and their expectations. And so we've been able to take all of that information and we've um, provided three public engagement approaches in the report that correspond to the characteristics and the context of three typologies that were also defined there. We're showing 
two here on this slide. The, there is a part uh, that's within neighborhood renewal, but that, that's part of an established program. So we're showing these two because they are more complex and um, include a connector bike system and also the major bike grid, which is the process we are using now for the Strathcona and for the downtown routes. These processes give more opportunities for the public to have input on the route locations, um, and we haven't done that before. There's also another step where we're looking through different concepts and we can get public input on the trade-offs that are made that help define how they fit into neighborhoods. And also because of the scale of some of these projects, we anticipate there's also going to be opportunity to get input on aesthetic things such as landscaping and detail, or landscaping and uh, barriers, if the barrier aesthetics. There are implications. Our typical process we've been doing now is about a two-stage process that takes place over four to six months. This six-stage process will likely take up to two years to complete, so it's going to take longer. And while we are building a system where we are going to um, get better input from residents, we, can expect, we, we, do, we can't expect that that process in itself is going to take away controversy. We have a number of citywide, or pardon me, we have a number of public education and communications programs that we do do to um, address some of the public education needs for these programs. Uh, this includes a citywide awareness program that's guided around um, attitudes towards sharing the road. We also do some construction education when new routes are built. built. Um, while we do see that there is some progress in these programs, we also recognize that there are some gaps. This fall, as part of the operating budget, a service package will be in there that will include two initiatives. One would fund a street team that would focus on pursuing in-person, neighborhood-level contact with people where construction is either imminent or done. So this is like somebody who would go straight up to the parents at the school drop-off zones and talk to them about the changes around them. The other opportunity is um, to enhance advertising to supplement the regular things we do um, within our communications, but we need to do more to communicate why we need this infrastructure and how it's a benefit to both cyclists and motorists. So that brings us to today. Um, we are asking for you to recommend to City Council that the public engagement approaches be approved. Um, and then we are also asking you to approve the recommendation to focus on the implementation plan and that would re require the deferral of the 76th Avenue and 121st Avenue reports. As noted, we are doing consultation right now in, on the Strathcona and downtown routes. Uh, there's a number of interviews underway. We have some significant public workshops planned for June 17th, 18th, and 19th. As Tyler mentioned, we will be returning in the fall with a report with an evaluation of some of the existing routes. And this fall, we'll also have some funding requests. Um, both from the capital budget to build some of the new infrastructure and an operating budget package as just described. So, thank you. Thank you, folks. So, we'll uh, have you step back and the panelists can come up. And, Councillor Asinger, if you could add one, please. Well, I would like, thank you. I'd like to move to add A. Ross to the speaker list for 6.1. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Councillor Anderson, Cape, okay, thank you. Motion carried. So, uh, Christopher Chan, so there's seven, is there seven seats, Madam uh, Clerk? Okay, so Christopher Chan, if you could take the first seat, uh, Elaine Solez, the second, Conrad uh, Nobert, the third, Michael Fair, next, Lyle Falk. Max Dion Buse, and then uh, A. Ross. What's A. Ross's first name? Do we know? <laughs> Number two, Elaine. No, this is, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, that's right. Michael, you're four. That's right. Switched. Okay. Okay. So just a quick. Quick run. Quick run through of the rules. You uh, have five minutes to speak. Uh, you'll see the timers: green for four, yellow for one, and uh, red when you're complete. So if we could try and. Stay as close to that five minutes, that would be fantastic. So, thank you. Mr. Chan, do you want to begin? Are we ready? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Christopher Chan. I'm the executive director of the Edmonton Bicycle Commuter Society. We represent over 1,300 paid members uh, and in general just represent cyclists in Edmonton. If the amount of consultation were proportional to cost and assuming the proposed downtown and Strathcona bike routes in this report carry a price tag similar to Calgary's Centre City cycle track, about $9 million, then an appropriate consultation period for the Valley Line LRT would be about 400 years, 1,200 stages. And while I'm sure it may feel like that sometimes to some of you, it's clear that the level of consultation proposed in this report goes to extraordinary lengths to reach a breadth and a depth of public involvement that we haven't seen before. The recommendations in this report on public engagement process is disproportionate. It's long, two years, six phases of consultation for about seven and a half kilometers of bike route. And it is, as we have heard, what committee members, council, and the public have asked for. And we support that. Not because we want to wait. Edmonton already has fallen behind Calgary, Winnipeg, Toronto, and of course, Vancouver and Montreal. And we'll continue to lag. But we wish, and we wish Edmonton had started this process a decade ago. But we support the recommendations in this report because it's so important to us that we're willing to earn the support of the stakeholders that we need to so that we can finally begin to build high quality bike infrastructure in Edmonton. Because how a person gets to work should be a matter of choice, not a matter of life or death. Because there are very few things that scare me, but I'm terrified that someday I will find myself setting up a ghost bike for a friend of my own or a family member. And because there's something fundamentally wrong about a city where people will enthusiastically tell you how terrified they are to be on the streets, not because of crime, but because of lack of infrastructure, basic safe infrastructure. Riding a bike is good for an individual's pocketbook and physical and mental health. A person who bikes 10 minutes to work each day is going to live an extra three and a half years beyond the same person who drives. And it's good for the city, less congestion, less demand for parking and expensive road infrastructure, more money spent to the local economy, reduced healthcare costs, improved security, and a happier, healthier population in a more vibrant, livable community. You've heard it all from me before, and it's still true. Uh, I've distributed a letter from the Oliver Community League supporting this report's recommendations specifically. They've reviewed it and they support it. And we've been meeting with representatives from the Strathcona, West Mountain, Downtown Community Leagues who also are asking for high quality bike infrastructure in their neighborhoods. They're, they want it. And it should come as no surprise to any of you, these are central core neighborhoods, both well suited for cycling and very lacking in dedicated cycling infrastructure. The committee asked for this report and it lays out a solid plan for the next four years with a deeply engaged consultation process and a focus on high quality, high demand routes. And I strongly encourage the committee to accept the report's recommendations and to go one step farther. Recognize that you asked for this plan and you asked for it to focus on these core routes. 
and you're going to have to pay for it. As far as transportation infrastructure goes, the price tag is going to be minimal and the return on investment great. But you will need to fully fund it, or after all of the debates, all of the consultations and public workshops and stakeholder meetings, we'll just end up with more of the same as before. So please support this plan and come to capital budget discussions in a few months. Remember that this is what you too have asked for. I took this photo up here a few weeks ago when I was going to the symphony. Uh, and I think the ESO was performing um, Russian masters that night, Rachmaninoff, Rimsky, Korsakov, not minimalist music. The thing with bikes is that they are quite small, quiet, easy to dismiss. After I got home and looked at this photo again, if you count the number of cars parked up to where the cyclist in the back is parking their bike, there are five cars. There's five bikes parked in this photo too. I'm not saying that car parking in front of the Windspear is bad, I use it myself, um, and it's uh, certainly valuable, but it is something to remember that it's easy to, to forget uh, and easy to, to miss how important cycling is to a city. And listen, it's not about making bike lanes for me, it's not about bike infrastructure for the avid cyclist. I don't even know really what that is. We don't have avid ETS users or avid car commuters uh, as such. What this really is about is about making the city a better place to live. If you walk down a street in a city that does right by pedestrians and cyclists, you know you're walking in a city that is a destination city, a good place to live and a good place for people, whether or not they bike, whether or not they, they take transit. Um, it's still a better place to live. And that's what we're really looking for. And we really strongly feel that this report, and this, the direction that it takes, both for consultation and for the roots, is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a uh, citizen um, of Edmonton living in the, uh, in the Old Strathcona area, and so I'm here to talk about um, uh, bike infrastructure today. So uh, at the very beginning, I'm going to speak on behalf of, of my community league. I'm, I'm, I'm on the board, and in December of 2013, we um, passed a motion supporting the, impl the implementation of a route that runs from Mill Creek to 114th Street, primarily along uh, 83rd Avenue as soon as possible. So this is a, a, um, a bicycle route that we were talking about. So I can o officially bring the uh, Community League's uh, support for uh, the, the 83rd Avenue bike route to, uh, yeah, to, to you today. And I, I've, I've submitted a letter from our uh, acting president uh, that, that, that also speaks to that. So that's my... From now on, I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Uh, so I was I was very happy to to see this this map in 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 the report. Um, it uh, like provides what what uh, what we've been asking for, I think, which is which is very high quality routes in in the core neighborhoods where uh, you know where where demand for cycling is already very high. Um, I think perhaps 51st Ave is an outlier, but 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 all the other routes look look wonderful. But I did want to um, focus in on um, on Strathcona here. You, know, you can see that 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 there will be a wonderful route if 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 you fund it and and all of that um, east to west. But a a north south one is missing. So um, from my community, I am I am asking for another route to be added. And and so this is like this would be a two way separated cycle track along uh, 104th Street. Now that is Calgary Trail. And so, you know, you, you might think, well, how would that work? This is a picture that I took of, of uh, where, where we think it, it would fit in great. There's, an, um, in, in my opinion, underutilized counterflow transit lane on, on uh, Calgary Trail. Right now it's a transit taxi bike lane on which you can only ride north in, in the, uh, like, in, or, or ride or 
or, or drive uh, northwards. So this would, would uh, become a, a uh, uh, facility similar to this. So it, it would, it would uh, you know, provide two-way um, safe separated uh, bike infrastructure so that, so that families in Strathcona and cyclists can access basically the, the Save on Foods and the Shoppers Drug Mart and, and all of the uh, like businesses that are, that are south of White Avenue. Right now, there, there isn't a safe legal way to, to, to reach there. You know, uh, my family and I, we always ride on 83rd Avenue and then frankly, we just take the sidewalk from, from, from this point. This was taken from 83rd Ave and it's, it's facing south um, because we're not gonna get on Calgary Trail with, with our bikes. So yeah, so so I I would I don't I don't know what the the process is. Uh, there is uh, you know momentum building in my neighborhood for you know to see this this uh, route north south built. So you know we would like to see it added to the map of of future major bike routes. So yeah, my you know my next point is basically that Old Strathcona loves bikes. Um, if 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 you uh, invest in in, in high quality infrastructure in Old Strathcona, you will not be seeing the backlash that, that you've, you've, you've seen in other communities. Um, so uh, Strathcona Centre and, and neighboring McKernan have the highest rates of cycling in, in the city. Strathcona is two, uh, like McKernan is one. And we want high quality bike infrastructure to protect us and our families. So I, I uh, um, two days ago, I sent out an email to some people that I know, saying, you know, let's let's take some pictures of of, of us uh, cycling around the city, and and I got uh, pictures from 12 different families that all live within blocks of me. So I just thought I would show you some of them. This is Linda and 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 Iris. They they cycle to school every morning. Monique and Sasha also cycle from the uh, you know, Mill Creek uh, part of our neighborhood to Garneau. Noam is in grade nine, and um, next year he plans on uh, to go to Old Old Scona. And right now he he lives near me. He lives on uh, 86th Avenue and 98th Street. Right now there 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 isn't a, a safe way, in uh, my opinion, for for him to do that. So so when Noam next year is cycling to school, uh, we're going to be thinking about him because it's very busy in that area. And um, but actually this north south route along Calgary Trail that I showed you would 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 solve that problem for him. But he 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 cycles to school every day. The clients actually live in Belgravia, but, but, but they cycle to our neighborhood uh, to use services on White Avenue and to visit friends. Mr. Norbert, if you could come to a close. Oh, for sorry. Five minutes, okay. That's fine, okay. thanks. So yeah, there are lots of cyclist families in our neighborhood and we love our bikes. So please fund the grid of major bike routes, add a two-way separated bike track, and keep the bike routes great. So, you know, they're, there will be pushback from uh, somewhere. And so, you know, the main thing is, is we don't want this to become this, all right? Because if, 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 if these routes are watered down, then they will be uh, useless to everyone. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Ms. Lest, yep. Good afternoon. Um, the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues is pleased to see the enhanced public engagement and education um, around bike infrastructure. We've heard over the years that consultation in the past um, was inadequate, although I appreciate uh, Chris's comments in, in that regard. And I don't know if people who say it's inadequate just think that if they go to a meeting and say they don't want it and you decide not to do it that that's adequate consultation you know I don't know what you know exactly what's behind uh, some of that um, because I agree with Michelle that it, more consultation isn't necessarily going to remove all controversy but in particular we are pleased to see the opportunity to consider alternate locations for routes um, a more extensive consultation process, the opportunity to consider design op options, um, and uh, the Federation is considering ways to contribute to public education around cycling infrastructure. Um, and we've been promoting the um, upcoming consultations on the, uh, the various routes currently uh, being considered. 
around, uh, around the uh, cycling infrastructure. Uh, hopefully that will um, uh, increase attendance. Uh, because again, some, one of the challenges is pe some people go to these workshops and consultations, others don't, and then the ones who don't get surprised and push back uh, when things, uh, when the routes are announced. Uh, over time, we hope to see a connected bike ne network uh, as infrastructure is built piece by piece, and we look forward to seeing increased cycling throughout the city and throughout the year. Uh, to this end, uh, EFCL does not support using bike lanes for snow storage, although that's what currently happens, uh, and because we would like to see them maintained so they could be used year-round. Um, and uh, we, anyway, we, we hope you go forward with what's being um, suggested to you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael Fair. Oh, I'm Aton Ross. I'm here just to support Mr. Michael Fair and ask questions or four questions, if need be. Uh, thank you very much. I, I want to begin by acknowledging that that in our neighborhood, um, and we're speaking about today, we recently had a bicycle death, um, very tragic incident that took place. Um, we have a bike lane working group that uh, Aton and I are, are chairing, um, has representatives from three communities, Oliver, uh, Westmont, and Gonora, to, and the purpose is to keep ourselves updated on proposed bike routes and to develop proposed strategies for the three communities on gathering support. We report back to the three communities. Uh, in terms of the report that is in front of you, uh, we support the recommendation number one, that enhanced public engagement be approved. Um, it, within that report, we're particularly supportive that the proposed north side route is described as a major bike route uh, to the core and a priority. Um, we also are pleased to see the considerations and guides for proposed routes, that, which include bike facilities, scale of impacts, cost, location, directness of route, bike volume, traffic, road conditions are all items that we think make good sense. We're happy to see those there as well. Uh, we also support the additional education of the general public that will be undertaken uh, if this uh, report is passed and the additional uh, and um, work will be done in the fall and then into next year. Some additional points that we would just make, um, or, and a couple of them are suggestions. Uh, the first is that Gonora and Westmont are also undergoing great neighborhood improvements and complete street programs program. Uh, we think it's extremely important that the bike route must be integrated together with these programs. Very concerned that they don't become one-off, that they're part of that overall redevelopment that's taking place in those two communities. Um, and, and that's happening now. That needs to, the, the integration of that needs to happen as fast as possible. Second, the 102nd Avenue Bridge is being rebuilt for the next 100 years. Um, and are the proposed plans for the bike route the best it could be? We know there are plans for it. Is it really the best for 100 years? That bridge is going to be there a long, long time. I uh, hope that that is, is looked at to make sure that's the case. Um, and not just that it's there because it needs to be there, but it's really the best way. Uh, third, bike routes are more than bikes. It's rollerblading, skateboarding, biking baby carriages, et cetera. The number of kinds of, of uses of bike routes is very extensive. Fourth, we want to emphasize that bike routes support family living in our neighborhoods, grandparents, parents, and children. And we can't emphasize, as we try to make older neighborhoods family friendly, that bike routes are one of those major ingredients that help make them friendly, grandparents, parents, and children. In addition, our bike route must be interesting, aesthetically pleasing and attractive. People must want to use it. It must be something that people say, wow, look at that route. We want one like that too. So make sure that we pay attention to the aesthetics and the attractiveness of routes. <clears throat> we are eager to move ahead. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, and thank you for, for allowing us to speak. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Mr. Falk. I have thank a you. So. Okay, we'll get you set up.
Hi, my name's Lyle Falk, and I'm a road user, and a bicyclist, and a cyclist, a motorist, and a pedestrian. I'm here to provide input to the bike lane infrastructure plan. I'm also here to report on the Dover Court community experience because uh, uh, I noticed in the report that that's one community that's supposed to get a bike path, and I'd like to provide what I think are good recommendations. So a few bicycle facts at first. Bicycles are vehicles as defined in the Traffic Safety Act. What that means is that bicycles can travel where cars can, but cars cannot travel where bike, in bicycle lanes. Bicycles are more nimble and maneuverable and can fit in small, narrow spaces and use terrain not available to vehicles. Wide roads are better for cyclists. Narrow roads create safety risks, forces bikes and vehicles being closer together. The majority of bicycles are used for less than six months of the year, mainly winter, late, late fall, early spring, which underutilizes the road real estate. Flexible bike lanes, for example, barriers that can be removed, are preferable so that other users can use the space in the winter when commute times increase in the city. The Dover Court ex community experience. Dover Court community was, went through a redevelopment two years ago that narrowed some of the streets by two meters. The city did not listen to the community which asked for road widths to be maintained, and I consider this to be a failure of the complete streets guidelines. This created more risks for cyclists as there is less space for cars and cyclists. Narrow roads catered to pedestrians at the expense of cyclists and vehicles. Now the proposal is to add bike lanes in this community on significantly narrowed streets. Narrow roads are extra narrow in the winter due to snow creating additional risks to all road users. Don't make these mistakes in other areas of the city, please. So my, rec my recommendations are, one, that bicycle lanes not be put on major arterial roadways and that they use roads that parallel arterial roadways or residential streets which contain less traffic. That the complete streets guidelines be modified so that streets are not narrowed in communities and that this, the community is listened to. Keep the streets nice and wide for safety. Modify the complete streets guidelines so that wide roads are preferred. It offers more room for all users. And take away the choke points that narrow the road for pedestrians, because this just creates additional risks for, cars, or for cyclists who must compete with space for cars. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have uh, Dion Buse. Hello, I'm um, here to speak on behalf of Complete Street Strathcona uh, and express our support for a quality um, cycling infrastructure on 83rd Avenue. I think it's an opportunity to create walkable, bikeable, livable uh, Old Strathcona and set precedence for future quality human scale projects throughout the city. Um, Conrad touched on it earlier as well. I'd also like to propose a north-south conversion of the um, bus, bike, taxi lane on 104th from 83rd up to University Avenue to be used as a two-way cycle track. It would connect the proposed 83rd with the existing 76th and create routes through the city. Um, I, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Questions from... Uh, he was just for questions. Yep. Ready? Councillor Esslinger. Certainly. I'd like to start with Mr. Folk. Um, you talked about uh, the narrowing of the roads during the uh, complete streets or the neighbourhood renewal project. Um, were you involved with public consultation during that process? Um, <clears throat> my mother lives in Dover Court and I grew up there. My mother was involved with it. Uh, I personally was not, but uh, being in the family, we talk, and I was well aware of, of what the proposals were, yes. Okay, so you're not a resident. You're, this is just an observation through well, Dover Court. I, you're not a resident I, currently. I'm not currently a resident, but I do share title on the house uh, in Dover Court with my mother. Okay, thank you very much. And um, so you're not sure if she had the opportunity to provide public input. No, so, I am sure. She okay. did go to the meeting. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions for now, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Councillor Knack. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, Councillor McKean. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Fair, um, one of the interesting things that, that came to my attention recently in <clears throat> meeting with some community folks in the communities you just mentioned was that the, when the terminology complete streets came up, they had no idea what it meant. And are you, are you um, so I wanted, to, uh, uh, I'm not trying to look for uh, who's at fault here, but do you, do you have a sense in those three communities you're talking about that people understand what's coming and two are in support of bike lanes and, and creating these, these complete streets uh, ventures? Perhaps there, there are two, um, or two things I might say. As, as, uh, first of all, I think that um, um, when you talk about the, those three communities and the number of people who live there, no, not everyone certainly is aware of what complete streets are. In fact, I'm sure the majority probably are not. But second of all, a part of our work in this, our working group, is to come up with strategies that can be used by the three communities to, in fact, inform people and bring them into the discussion um, and to find people who wish to support the, the bike routes and, and the understanding of, of what this is. Um, <clears throat> I might just add, if I can, just for real quickly, um, that next year when you're looking at the budget, it might even be practical that, that some of the, the thinking about public education would include a little money for groups, uh, the communities, to be able to do some of the leafleting, some of this. We, we're going to make that happen anyway kind of thing in that, but that could be something that would be helpful when you have a community group who wants to talk to their neighbors. But that, I think, is part of our work. Yeah. Um, the other thing I, I thought was really intriguing, and I hadn't really, uh, I'll admit, thought of it before, was you brought up the uh, notion of creating attractive uh, uh, bike lanes. And do you have any, uh, can you, can you uh, help me see what you mean? Because I know that we probably, we, we, we are guilty sometimes of just looking at sort of utility, but what, what intrigues me about this is, and, and I think you said it, that you create a great bike, uh, bike infrastructure in a particular area, then maybe you start to uh, break down some of the barriers in other areas and people, uh, neighborhoods will actually want them. So, so what does that look like? Uh, if I may. Um, we all want our neighborhoods to look good and, uh, and um, so, you know, in our mind's eye, you know, when you see some of the streets that have traffic calming that have the uh, small kind of cement structures, but with plants and with some growth, um, so they not only provide a, a practical, a utilitarian uh, purpose for, say, slowing traffic or creating a bike lane, but there is, um, there are added layers of purpose, beautification, um, you know, perhaps more oxygen, this kind of thing, so I think it's usually in everybody's uh, interest to build a beautiful, functional neighborhood, um, and that adds to our economy, you know, property uh, values in a sense. Uh, so to beautify is not, I think, um, is not uh, a frivolous thing. I think it's very important uh, and crucial to the use of, the functioning, the use of the bike lanes and the overall um, development of a neighborhood or um, a community economy and city. So, uh, Mr. Fair, you've got, we've got, I see we've got a letter from the Oliver Community League. Do you know, uh, have Westmount and Glenora sort of signed off on this? I, they were not asked, to, uh, um, sorry, I, Oliver did not ask the other communities to obviously to, to uh, do that, but the, the representatives from those communities are, are, are part of our bike working group and that we, we are, and we report back to each of those community leagues kind of thing and that. Um, so they, they are well aware and working on this as well. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thank you. I uh, overlooked myself before I went to the non-committee members, so I had a couple questions. Uh, to, so, Mr. Chan, you were involved, you've been involved in this all the way from, from the beginning. Uh, and I just had a question around the goal of a bike network, in your view, in terms of, is it for you about the numbers of kilometers of bike lanes or the numbers of riders that that network uh, produces? Bike infrastructure for me is actually more of a means to an end to a better, more livable city. 
what that looks like is going to vary from city to city. In Edmonton, what we're really looking for is a city where you have that option and it's an easy, safe option, choice to make if you want to bike on any particular day to anywhere. How we start that out uh, and whether that means doing that city-wide network as, as quickly as possible or, or the really high quality stuff. Uh, I think the direction that, that we're going now, which is to focus on those core central areas at the cost of not as many kilometers, I think it is the right way to go because it will um, make that shift and, and, and I think it's the, the best starting point to make that shift. Okay, and I think you're, you know, I appreciate your interesting comparison uh, around consultation, uh, but to construct and develop facilities that people will f will be inspired to use because they feel safe, they feel attracted to them, That's that should be our priority. Definitely. And I think facilities that get people using them. Definitely. They right. have to be high enough quality and, and not, make as, not make so many concessions that they're not, uh, they're not desirable for right. cyclists to use. And when they are desirable, then the other communities perhaps will see them and, be, and, and then desire them themselves. Sure. Okay, and, and uh, so sort of on that in that same uh, same line of questioning, uh, Mr. Norbert, you showed the picture of the separated lanes and the on street painted on street lane. Can you comment on how you feel really about both of those? Do you think that the city had, just say a little bit more about that in terms of family safety? Because you ride with your kids uh, everywhere, probably as much as anybody in the city does. So yes, um, yeah. I mean. Um, I think I think that that often when certainly in the past uh, the the main cycle um, cyclist in in our mind's eye has been the strong and fearless uh, person maybe it, usually a male in in spandex you know given her on the road kind of thing right and and uh, and <laughs> taking on those cars and my 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 point was that in in my neighborhood right now today um, families want to move around safely using bicycles and. and and so that that Sharrow on the road, you know, if you painted a Sharrow on Calgary Trail, zero people would use it, except except for maybe those stronger, fearless cyclists. So so yeah, we're looking for places that that you know we we can be comfortable riding with our families. It doesn't mean a three-year-old on a bike that has no idea, but but my my sons are are street savvy, but they still need a safe place to ride. So so you you think our focus should be on separating away from car traffic? Well. We, um, like my my opinion is that I should never have to share the road with a car that's going over thirty kilometers an hour, and so in 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 some some situations it is um, uh, uh, appropriate to traffic common area and make a bike boulevard where uh, you know something where it's not separated. But there aren't many cars, and those that there are going slowly. But but where there are cars moving uh, swiftly, I think that separation is is uh, very important. Okay, uh, so and Mr. Fair, you talked about the city maybe putting a little bit, a little bit more money into public education for leafleting, and can you say a little I bit more? Just, that was intriguing because yes, I, I, I think that the, the we support the notion of additional public education. What I was saying is that at, at certain um, communities, and we're an example at the moment where we have a, uh, a group of citizens who have come together and say, let's work on this and we're going to meet with citizens, etc. That little bit of money might make a difference. I'm not asking for ourselves. We're okay. But for the future, as you look at this, I mean, if there are that, it just makes a difference. It, Brochures cost money. Reaching out folks in communities like ours, you got to do some of it by mailing. We're high rises, etc. So that's all I'm mentioning is a possibility. When you look at the budget, not now, next year, that some of public education might have some money available for communities that are working on this and wish to move forward. I think that's an important. That's a question I have for administration: is where where can we support communities and and particularly engaged communities to lead the public education component, speaking to themselves and among themselves, as opposed to the city just talking to them about it. So I appreciate that. Uh, I'm out of time anyway. So, uh, Councillor Henderson, thank you. Uh, just very quickly, Mr. Fair, while I have you here, because I I'm think I'm hearing from you, and I just want to double check at something that I've been, I'm, I'm going to have this question for administration as well. So I'm going to be hearing from a couple of the communities I have that are going through neighborhood renewal. Your, your point is that as we do neighborhood renewal, and this may speak to the consultation piece around that, we need the time to make sure that we're asking 
answering some of these questions about the bike infrastructure and I'm guessing the pedestrian infrastructure at the same time. It, absolutely. It's certainly the, the, what we hear from some of the folks in both Westmont and Glenora, they're going through this po and the process of renewal. Yeah. Bike lanes should be included at the same time so they're not coming back for the 43rd time for more discussion right. on something new where it should be part of that work right so away, just like the bridge should be. And I realize and I realize I'm not sure you can speak for them, but you no. raised it. Um, but do you know from their experience whether or not the consultation process that we're having right now on the renewal piece is creating the right space for that discussion to happen at the right time? Because that's my question about this process, and right. and I can tell you in Bonnie Dune and Queen Alex, I'm not sure it is, and they're asking the same questions. I, I think both communities would say that that it's kind of catch up. Okay. That with that, I think things started before, and they're trying to catch up with the bike route. In with that, I think there's still a ways to go. Great, thanks. Those are my questions. Okay. Anyone else, Councilor Caterina? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, quickly. Um, Mr. Falk, uh, you're the only one that I'm not quite sure if you agree with this report or disagree with this report. Well, the others are obvious. What's it? <clears throat> well, all, my point is, I, is that <clears throat> is that uh, roads shouldn't be narrowed. So there's you're putting bicycles and cars closer together. That's one point. The other is is that it inc increases commute times when you do narrow roads, which is. Uh, roughly 80% of the traffic in Edmonton. And there's some statistics counted. I have another slide on one of the other presentations that 1.3% of people commute by bicycle in Canada. It's lower than average in Edmonton and more people commute by that. So I'm not against bike lanes, I'm for them. Um, I'm saying they're a vehicle, they can, they can ride on the road just like cars can. And if people don't feel comfortable, there's always a parallel or a route through a neighborhood that has less traffic on it that can be utilized. That's my point. Okay, and to the point uh, and one of your bullet points here that uh, defined uh, in the Traffic Safety Act as a vehicle. Yes. So that That's what I'm, what I'm saying is that a bicycle can ride on any roadway. Okay. Can except for ride? freeways, I don't think they're allowed on. Ride on, on sidewalks? If they're a vehicle? I don't think so, no. But here's, here's, an op here's another opportunity. You could make all sidewalks shared use. If they're, if they're widening them anyway, why not make them shared use? Then you protect the cyclists. They have to yield to pedestrians. And then the road is freed up for traffic where cyclists don't want to ride anyway. OK, that's an interesting point because uh, it seems to me that uh, bicycles want to be on the road with cars. They want to be on the sidewalk with pedestrians. Uh, and if there's a classification for them, and I would imagine that they would agree to wear helmets, uh, licensing, insurance, just like any other vehicle that uh, shares the road. But I haven't heard that. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak to that because uh, I don't think you, re you don't require a license and you don't require insurance on a bicycle right now. So I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what the legal implications are if you hit someone with your bike. So maybe Thank Mr. You. Chan can address that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chan, just may, maybe because the bicycle commuters, you have about 1,300 people in, in your group. Could you maybe elaborate a little more on, to Councillor Katarina's question? Is there, do, do you feel that there's something that cyclists in general want? Or do, they, do they want everything? Or what, what, what are, do you think you could adequately summarize what you think your members are looking for? Because I think you did, but just. Cyclists want to be able to, well, people want to be able to have the choice of how they get where they want to go safely and efficiently. Right now, some people choose to ride on the sidewalk because they don't feel safe on the roadway. Um, but riding on the road is a much more efficient and in general a much safer way to travel. So what we're really looking for is the kind of infrastructure that, that recognizes that cycling is a different form of transportation than walking. It is different than driving. And that when you clarify those um, the rules and the positions on the roadways by adding actual cycling infrastructure, it can make tra everything work a lot smoother in traffic and safer for pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Solis, um, talking about with the comments we just heard on narrow roadways, in relation to bike safety, because we're talking about the bike part here, we'll talk about complete streets later, but um, does the EFCL have a viewpoint on narrow roadways and the impact for the increase in safety or decrease in safety? And I guess we'll relate it specifically to cyclists, but. 
Um, I have to say we really haven't considered that, but I can speak from having gone through neighborhood renewal in my own community where the um, trade-offs we were willing to make as a community when um, sections of, of sidewalk needed to be completed when the community was built. There were some sidewalks, but they didn't go all the way through, and when neighborhood renewal came along, uh, the city wanted to complete those sidewalks, and there were a lot of mature trees along those roadways, and the roads were wider than they needed to be. We were willing to have the roadways narrowed to accommodate the sidewalk or the multi-use trail in the other in the other instance, rather than to have uh, trees sacrificed or green space sacrificed. Okay, and we'll talk more about complete streets later. So, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. The other purpose of the narrowing is to help deal with uh, the speed, especially in the neighborhoods where the roads were were quite wide. And so I think the city started to look at that. I see nodding heads, but from a complete streets point of view and with the EFCL, I, I'm, I recognize you see this differently, sir, but but uh, I'm trying to connect the dots here. So just to be just to be clear, that's your interpretation. The other the other motivation for the narrowing is to deal with some of the speed we see on some of these wider streets, correct? Ms. Solis, yes. maybe? Yes. <laughs> so to Mr. Nobert's point about uh, not feeling comfortable mixing with traffic, mixing with vehicular traffic above 30 kilometers an hour, if the intent is to try to get the speeds in the neighborhoods to a point that uh, all modes are welcome on the street, because it's a complete street where all modes are welcome, that's I think the definition of complete, I think that's the meaning. Uh, recognizing that's gonna change from street to street, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do that on Calgary Trail. You're gonna look for something separated or ideally right, right off Boulevard separated, because you got cars going plenty fast there at speed. You don't want, you, you might want even a boulevard between you, not just a concrete thing. So, um, so there's a tension there. So I guess to Mr. Falk, your concern is that slowing down traffic in the neighborhood is an undesirable thing. No, <clears throat> I never said that at all. I said narrow streets create risk for both cyclists and motorists. But for you also, oh, and, and I, I understand that that's so, a tension there and that's a, a potential sure. trade-off, but you said it adds to commute times as well. Yes, because when you go down, for example, on 124th Avenue in the Dover Court community, which is one of the roads that was narrowed by two meters, okay, you have traffic parked on both sides. Previously, you could have two cars pass. So now what happens is you have certain parked cars and it's the dodge and go kind of thing, right? You know, somebody pulls over, you go like this to try to get down the street. Uh, the community, I think at that time, the meeting my mother, my 86-year-old mother went to, was uh, proposed uh, speed bumps. I also would propose putting permanent uh, photo radar in uh, on a street post or something like that. There's, a, there's other options than narrowing streets. There's financial incentives. There's, there's uh, you know, like the, when I say that, like ticketing is, is one option. Uh, furthermore, in the wintertime, these streets get even narrower because of the wind rows, it pushes the parked cars closer to the middle, which makes it even difficult to pass, like a country road or something like that. So. Is that five minutes? No, I think I, we must have, uh, you can keep going. Okay. Well, just just thank you for that. Uh, just one more, Mr. I think Mr. We... Chen. I think the logic <laughs> here is uh, in the recommendations is start where the demand is high, and uh, where some of the interaction with traffic is most complex because they're busy roads in the core and where there's an existing group of users. Would it be your organization's view? Because we're talking about the next four years that we sort of start there and then grow outwards uh, in order to try to connect more people into that infrastructure as we as we go. I'm just, the report really focuses on the next few years and I, w I would like you to, uh, from the Edmonton Bicycle Commuter point of view, where do you think we might go next if we're able to actually fund and deliver this? And I, I hear your challenge there loud and clear, by the way. Uh, I, think, I think starting in the core and growing out is the direction to take. Um, what that looks like afterwards, the bicycle transportation plan um, adjusted as it is now, uh, I think still has a lot of core good ideas in it and, and lots of potential routes that are still relatively high demand, even after the, the routes in this current plan get built. Um, definitely, we can go to the next step of those next still relatively central routes and continue building outwards. 
and then this consultation process, thorough though it is, if we are advancing that concurrently for those other routes as we move forward through learning as we go, do you think that's going to be a smoother process for us? I think so. I think even this consultation process, there's still things to learn and maybe it will get adjusted, maybe it will get shortened, maybe not. Maybe after we do it a few times, it won't take two years, maybe we can exactly. get it down to one, but yeah, because um, I hear your point there too. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks all of you for coming today. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for your, there's no further questions for the panel, so I appreciate your time, your commitment. So we'll have admin come back up. So thank you, Councillor Esslinger. Thank you very much, and I, I certainly appreciate these recommendations and uh, that you kind of heard what people have said and the direction that it's going. I just need some clarification on some of the points. Um, and if we were going to accept this recommendation, we did hear a comment about cost earlier. Do we have a sense of the cost of this recommendation? Of which recommendation? To go into the public engagement and that piece is the, the recommendation number cost? one. Yeah. And for um, resources, we'd look to capital funding to help bring some of the resourcing, whether it's consultants or other kind of um, things, on board, and then the rest would be managed through existing operating. Okay, and for then for number two, do we that'll come forward into the capital budget? Is that my understanding? That's correct. Okay, um, now I would like to jump into some of the processes around the engagement. If I heard correctly and I understand the materials through the engagement process, which I think is very thorough, um, we're going to give the community the opportunity to look at the design, the route location, and aesthetics. Is that correct? Yes. So when I look at the piece around neighborhood renewal, are, will there be an opportunity for communities to talk about where the routes are and what that's going to look like? Okay. That is what we have been doing. Um, for instance, most recently at least, with Bonnie Dune, for instance, they. Um, as part of the, the first phase of the meetings for neighborhood renewal for that neighborhood, we were made aware that the neighborhood was looking for additional bike routes and slight changes to bike routes uh, as compared to the bike plan. So uh, from that information, we prepared uh, route options that we brought back to the community as part of uh, the meeting number twos and got feedback and further uh, input on that. And that will be refined and taken back to, to meeting number three. Um, but. I think as, as Michelle had alluded to or presented, you know, our, our piece of the neighborhood renewal, it, it's, a, it's an existing public uh, consultation piece, an engagement piece that we are just a part of. We're not necessarily driving that, that initiative. Okay, because I've attended some neighborhood renewal meetings recently in Roslyn, and there was no mention at all at the public meeting about bike routes or where that would, conversation was going to be. So I'm trying to understand where and when they're going to provide that input. Um, I, I certainly can't speak to that. I don't manage that, that portion of, the, uh, of engagement, that's for sure. And uh, it's not really Michelle's role either. P perhaps we could... Uh, we could respond to that um, through a report to to committee, if, if you'd I, like that. I think that. it would be valuable because we're saying we're going to engage them or we're going to give them opportunities. We need to make sure that that is provided to mm -hmm. communities and that concerns me um, because that's what I've heard uh, many mm -hmm. times and I, I, we don't want to get back in the situation that at the end of neighborhood renewal, they have Cheryl's on the road but they didn't know why they're there right. and they had no chance to change the yeah. routing. I know there is, there is an example, uh, the, the, the pilot project for Westmount Community is a complete streets pilot neighborhood where it has a slightly adjusted public engagement process as well. 
Okay, and we'll be talking about that in complete streets because when you're doing complete streets, they seem to be talking about bike routes. But when we're talking about just neighborhood renewal as we have the program, it hasn't come up in those neighborhoods. Um, and I've heard that from some of the neighborhoods and from the ones I attended, it did not come up as well. Um, the, the other thing that I'd, I'd like to understand as we, we're going forward and we're making these routes, we did hear today about um, a north-south route on 104th. Is, has that been considered? We have heard uh, from the community on that before. I, I believe years and years ago, um, before I was working at the city, there had been some discussion with transit about uh, options to, to remove the route. Uh, I wasn't involved in that, but it is something that we could, we could look at as, as part of the plan. Okay, those are all my questions from now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Well, just, just picking up on that, would that entail moving the bus over to to Gateway Boulevard then? We wouldn't delete the route, would we? Or, or I can't really that... speak for transit, but I think the the options could be moving it over to Calgary Trail or creating a, an additional contraflow by bus lane possibly on, on Gateway. I, I don't really know what the ramifications are. We'd have to look at it and talk with transit. Well, cycling as I do in that area, it's very handy going northbound to be able to be in that in that spot, but it does it does get a lot trickier trying to go southbound. Uh, so there's a bit of an asymmetry there. I, I think that might be worth not so much saying that's the answer, but saying what's the north-south connectivity through there. Because when we, when we picked uh, in the previous work, putting the route on, uh, which was it, 106 or 107 that we wound up? 106. That one, there was some trade-offs with going to that one versus uh, 107 five. or 5, 105. So there is a north-south connection there, but the, uh, it's a little tricky to use that intersection going in one of the, I think it's the northbound direction there. It's a little tricky. So maybe there's a couplet. I don't know. But I think it would be good to take a look at that because it's going to keep coming up in the consultation. And if we're building a network, because there's obviously a network on the north side map, there's a bit less of a network on the south side map, so I think that would be worth investigating. And uh, the challenge is, I guess that ends, that goes from, what, 76th up to 83rd, right? It, and then after 83rd, it becomes just a conventional separated four-lane road, I think. Yes, with parking on the uh, east side. But then the other piece of the network, and it doesn't show up on the map, is there's a um, the, the profile that's mentioned in here for enhancing that multi-use trail along Saskatchewan Drive because that's part of the grid as well, east-west for, for the south side there. Uh, so being able to get to that as well. Anyway, I, I, so I, I'd encourage the investigation of that as part of the, part of the work. Um, one other question I had about the grid is um, whether any thought has been given, because we're going to be talking about Blatchford a bit next week, and, and um, I saw some of the material for it, and it's got really nice connectivity internally for cyclists to be able to move through the development and get to the train station, but there might be some who would want to carry on into the core and stay on their bike. So um, I just, I'm kind of curious how the grid that we're looking at here with the downtown routes and the 105 Avenue piece um, and the 102 Avenue piece might connect up to Blatchford. Does that, is there a good connection identified in the medium term in the bicycle transportation plan for that? The, the current connection, that's not, it's not shown on the map because it's been built. It was built as part of the North LRT. There's a shared use path that connects from 105th Avenue, the um, Grant McEwen northbound that would connect to Kingsway Mall and Nate. The other intention is the... the that, that's done? That's constructed and operating, yep. So yep. We're not waiting on the signal system for. We're not waiting on the signals for the shared use path. No. Yes. Yeah, it's open. We got something done. Yeah. That's good. Um, the other piece, I guess, to tie into Blatchford would be that north-south piece through the uh, Albert Avenue. Um, it's shown as 119th Avenue on this map, but the the intention would be it would connect through to Blatchford and into Prince Charles in the west of the Blatchford neighborhood. And, and I think that's the, the medium-term question, not the 14 to 18 question, but how does this feed into connecting to some other destinations as we go? And I think as we review this, seeing, you know, where we might go next so we can start to, you know, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We've got we to walk before we run here, and I think, 
I think we're erring on the side of moving slowly with the consultation. I think there's virtue in that. I really appreciate the patience of the cycling advocates who are here with us today around that. I understand that they feel this is a long time, but so anyway, the, the connectivity to Blatchford was one in the south side piece um, that says we're going to get a report on the winter maintenance pilot or that there is a report coming, a report is being written. Is that going to come here or is that internal operational? We, I don't how think will we been, see the... Yeah, I, I don't think it's been decided yet whether or not it would be coming to Transportation Committee or whether it would be a memo to Council. Um, if you have direction on how you'd like to see that, that would be helpful. Um, yeah, I don't know that it needs to be here. I think it would just be useful to see it, as at least as a memo. Um, the early sweeping, too, because I think there's a spring cleanup piece to this, too. That I got a lot of positive feedback that that made those routes usable a little earlier in the year than in previous years. So, so that's one piece of feedback for your report, totally anecdotal, but from someone who gets stopped on the street from time to time for these comments. Um, and then the last thing is, from the preliminary, what you're hearing from... Are you hearing good things from all of these neighborhoods we're talking to in addition to the ones that showed up today in preliminary contact? Yeah, we've had uh, interviews with uh, Glenora all over downtown. We're having this week. Um, Strathcona and Garneau, all of them have been uh, very supportive of, of what's happening. They, you know, as I live downtown and, and when I go to the south side, there's, there's lots of bikes and there's lots of people walking around. and. The, it is a, a high demand area, so they seem to really see the value in it and they want to make it safer. Well, I'm glad you're doing that that early engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, a couple questions before we go to other committee members or other uh, non committee members. The goal of high ridership, can you confirm that, that that is our goal as a city, is that we want as many people to choose to ride bike, bikes as commuters or recreational as possible? That's, that's certainly one part of it. Um, you know, I think this is also about, some of the speakers alluded to, about some of the other goals that we have in the way ahead in the city vision about building vibrant communities. There's certainly a, a major safety objective and goal to this as well. So it's not just about ridership, but it is, uh, that is, yeah, I, I think it's, but it's better. about ridership, it's about safety for those riders. Correct. It's about, about having. Creating livable, vibrant Right, people riding bikes through communities, reducing yep. congestion. Certainly. Right. That's right. Uh, supporting uh, enhanced density. That's another issue. But uh, the so, do you think this new approach, the shift in focus to the major routes and the core, building from the core out, with a longer consultation period, helps achieve our goals? I I certainly think it does. We will. You know, I think it'll be up to uh, to yourself and your colleagues to determine as part of the budget deliberations about mm -hmm. how, how much of this plan gets done or which routes do we move forward on, and that, I think, will really dictate our success at achieving some of those objectives that you just right. mentioned. Yeah, and certainly I think the more that people are supportive and excited and engaged, and it takes a while to build up to, to that kind of community, uh, will certainly make the funding decisions easier. The... Uh, uh, Major shift, another major shift is that the communities uh, get, a, get more of a say in route selection, and that is a, that's different than it was before, correct? Yes. Okay. Super. Now, uh, in terms of the public engagement piece, uh, again, appreciating that we're taking longer, but there's two kinds of public engagement. There's sort of cattle call. We're going to set up a meeting and put up a poster and some people come and most people don't. Uh, or we micro, we sort of micro-target. We go to groups of people who we know will be supportive, unsupportive, but have constructive feedback. Is our engagement process more focused, less on the cattle call and more on focused, targeted, active citizens? It's focused on getting a broad range and a diverse range of people to the table, but we also want them to be at the table with each other. So right. when we think about those so debate. big public workshops that we're going to be having, there's going to be a lot of people there, but we need them to have different perspectives and points of view. Okay. But the question is, is are we seeking them out and going to them, or are we just setting up meetings and crossing our fingers? Sorry, those are workshops. We are seeking out the stakeholder, or stakeholder okay. group interviews that we're having now with a really, really broad range of, of people. In fact, we're out there three to f about three or four interviews a day. 
Um, and then we are also developing plans for us to go where people are to get their input. So if you talk about going to a farmer's market, for example, and having a, a, a site there to get some input in those kinds of places. Okay. There's also online engagement that we will, sure. you know, some people just can't make meetings or, or they can't uh, find times in their busy schedules. So we're providing a lot of opportunities through that means as well. Okay. So this summer, Southgate Mall is opening a bike station. Would that be a place for an engagement in your view where we, the city could be there? You know, you get a real mix of motorists. Yep, seems yep. appropriate. Okay. Uh, if you just the dates, that would be great. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you know when we know. The, the, in, mm, so the, the mayor asked about the winter uh, roadway maintenance, and I think that it would be interesting to have a conversation about that at the committee. I don't know if that's appropriate, but I, I kind of feel like it would be because we hear from the community uh, very loudly that lanes should be seasonal, and I think there's all kinds of reasons why we why they're not, and I don't think they should be, but. Uh, it's easy for them to make that argument when we, as someone previously mentioned, we use them to store snow. So is there a way, how do you think this year's pilot went? Uh, maybe I'll ask that question firstly on 106th Street. We're still collecting a lot of information. I think we still have uh, the results of one more survey to, to collect. I think it, uh, it provided a lot of insights and a lot of areas where we know we need to improve and I think it'll help us identify what those improvements need to be and the implications of those improvements. So, but philosophically, if we construct a bike lane or any sort of facility, we sh if we don't clear the snow, we're by default deeming it a seasonal lane, are we not? Thus, we should clear it. Yeah, I think, I think you're onto something. A lot of cities, we, uh, we sent some staff to the Winter Cycling Congress that was held in Winnipeg. A lot of cities will start with a uh, they'll have a, a seasonal, some of the lanes will be seasonal, but a lot of the network, they'll have a backbone network to get to the major destinations that will be cleared throughout the winter. Right. Um, so it, it's sort of a, the, yeah, the strategy is a little bit more flexible sometimes. Well, I think I might put forward a motion that, uh, ask someone to put forward a motion that brings back a more robust debate about that, because I don't think it's as simple as it, as it should, as it appears. Okay. Uh, Councillor Oshry. So uh, with your public engagement that you've been talking about, so you're talking about, you're talking to people in the neighborhoods that this is obviously being affected in, correct? That, those neighborhoods, but it, I think it has bigger citywide implications okay. too. Great, so that was what I was asking to ask, is, is how do you talk to the neighborhoods that maybe it's a commuter route going through, so you're looking at putting bike lanes in a neighborhood, but it actually affects people on the outskirts of town who drive or take the bus through that neighborhood every day? Um, and, and yeah, we, so we are engaging some of the local groups, but we're trying to do everything we can to make it attract, knowledgeable and to have opportunities for people who are not directly from those areas to participate because they do have interests, as you say, as commuters that run through or as people that have children that go to schools. So. So how, are, a, so how are you doing that? How, how are, are we doing, doing that? Yeah. Well, it's the whole consultation process is kind of built around there. We have a very aggressive advertising campaign that's out there right now that's helping build some awareness. Um, we have the online consultation, as we mentioned before. I mean, that, that's available everywhere. And the, uh, the workshops that we're going to do will be, they'll be large. We're anticipating citywide attendance at those just it's, good. it's an interesting topic right now. Um, and even just if we do, we, you know, we're talking about doing those go to places where people are. Well, the people from surrounding areas go to a farmer's market, for example. So that's the way that we're reaching out to them. Okay. Are you, uh, this might sound odd, um, are you going to set up a booth at the car show? I mean, one of the, one of the challenges if you're setting up booths and you're trying to engage in people and it's at bicycle clubs and it's at, places where people bark, park their bikes, I'd like you to set up a booth at the car, at the auto show, and talk to the people that, that drive every day and see what they think about the bike lanes. I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm actually being, I'm being quite serious. Uh, no, I know, and we've I mean, been uh, looking at you know, what criteria do we have for that, and we have a certain number um, of resources available. Uh, we've, we're intending to focus our efforts on areas where a broad range of people are coming to a local destination. 
but we could consider a car show. I just don't know all the ramifications of that. Well, like I said, I just think it's not necessarily appropriate to only solicit views from the bicycle community and where, where the bicycle community um, would help, would, would hang out. Uh, I think it's, you know, broad-based view gathering is always... Uh, we have been talking to AMA as well and a number of different user groups, so it's not... We, we need to have a broad audience for this and a broad conversation in our community because not everybody's biking right now and some people will never bike, but we still need to understand what uh, their points of view on uh, on this issue are. Okay. Um, just a specific question. Um, when you're looking at, like, um, picking 102nd Avenue, so are you, are you looking at taking out vehicle lanes or are you looking at adding it to the, so on the side of the sidewalks? The first stage of the consultation for 102nd Avenue is actually looking at where the route's located and how do we consider what the best route location would be. So we're looking at 102nd Avenue and 103rd Avenue are two options. So, so is, that, is that an option to take out a, a vehicle lane on 102nd Avenue? We haven't got to that, that level of analysis. That's the second phase of consultation is about once we know where the route's going to be located, we have to look at various different design options. Okay. Um, knowing, you know, knowing that the train will ultimately be running on Stony Plain Road, taking away two lanes of traffic, you know, we're very aware that the, the vehicle carrying capacity of 102nd Avenue is very important to provide access to downtown, so. I mean, that was, uh, thank you for mentioning that. That was exactly what I was going to go to with the LRT and, and other routes. We have to be careful of the commuter traffic. It's one thing to take out lanes from here and there, but if it does affect, uh, you know, the whole west side of the city in this situation, that's something that has to be considered. Certainly. So I'm encouraged to hear that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Um, I want to look, at, and this may be not for you to answer the questions, but you're the only guy sitting there. I'm, I actually am mm -hmm. curious about, about the consultation process for the neighborhood renewal piece that lines up with the opportunistic stuff. Because, it, I, I, you know, right now, and I think it's what's in this plan, um, we're basically going and talking to the community league. And based on that, we're getting an idea of what kind of stuff they would have. And then we're coming back with something that is pretty, it's not a finished plan, but there's not a lot of time to do a lot of adjustment after that. In Bonnie Dune, I think the community had the foresight to actually go to some of the places that the community would have gone anyway. In Queen Alex, I think they sort of missed it. And now they're wanting to talk about some stuff, and I'm not sure the time is there anymore. And this concerns me that we're going to be rebuilding a neighborhood that is interested in bike lanes, that is interested in looking at some problematic pedestrian connections, and they're a little bit behind the eight ball because we didn't talk to the community early. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering... In terms of that process, it seems to me, and I think Councillor Essinger is sort of doing the other end of it, where it's not even coming up as an early conversation. So unless the community league puts it on the table, we're missing a window. And I'm wondering, it's the one thing that concerns me about the consultation piece that's in here. Um, so, yeah, we haven't built into the approaches that are there um, an idea of how can community groups put it on the table, whether or not they're working on a renewal project or some other reason. So we would have to look at that. We could bring that back. And I'm specifically that. talking about what's happening in our renewal projects where we're going in anyway, and it just seems to me by going to the community league and expecting them to anticipate all the kinds of things that the larger community would put on the table as part of the process is probably leaving some gaps. So, Councillor Henderson, I'm hearing what you're saying, and I'm feeling like we need to do some connecting of the dots between some of these programs and take another look at how we're uh, progressing with our neighborhood renewal. And it will it will take some time because there is a lead time and making sure we've get all those um, uh, neighborhoods constructed in that time. But I think we want to take a look at how well, we're developing that process and and, and how how well, we can. And Come just as a heads up, there. in Queen Alex, I'm now getting the questions of how do we do this, and we're already on to, we've already gone through two sets of meetings, right? And there's keen interest in doing it. Queen Alex is identical to Strathcona, so I think a lot of the same sensibilities are there, and, and we're already feels like we're behind the eight ball on this because we didn't catch it early enough. So it's just a heads up. Um, I'm interested in this question about the north-south uh, connections on the south side of the river because because we've we've got counts on how many bikes come off bikes and pedestrians but bikes come off the high level bridge it's about a thousand a day isn't it yeah. it's uh, two thousand a day across the high level bridge day. okay so we have 2, we have two thousand bikes that are showing up on the you know that are showing up well let's say one thousand because some of them are going the other direction um, that are showing up on the south side of the river and basically dead ending at that point um, uh, they can go up they can go across to 110th, but um, 110th is got a stop sign on every corner and is and is potholed between the stop signs. 
they can go the other way down Saskatchewan Drive, but not if they're coming, not if they're coming towards the high-level bridge, because it's basically, we're calling it a multi-use trail, but it's the width of a sidewalk. Um, and then they hit 106, which is we, where we painted a bike lane on top of the gravel that is that road. So I'm really just, I, I, it seems to me this, the north-south piece, there's a lot of use there. And especially it goes east-west and it goes north-south, it does both. And the east-west, I mean, I think if we can deal with the, Fort, if the Saskatchewan Drive piece, that will help. But I'm wondering how, what our thoughts are about the north-south piece there, because it's, uh, because, I mean, we know we have a lot of bike traffic there right now, and I'm not sure, I mean, even before we get over to 104th and 106th, um, there's also that piece as well. It goes right up to Belgravia, Windsor Park, and further south. So any thoughts on how we can deal with that? The, uh, the Old Strathcona Garneau route that we're consulting on right now runs from, you know, in the bike plan, it runs from 112th Street through to Mill Creek Ravine north south that, but that's, but that's really the desire west. lines east west but yeah. the desire lines from that route are really to get to the university or to, to get to the high level bridge so at some point you need to get north south uh i anticipate that when we get into garneau with whatever route wherever it's located if it's 81st avenue through 84th avenue i don't know where it will be we will have to figure out how to how to tie it to the university and ultimately northbound well, so, so that piece could be could be part and parcel of that project. Yeah. Other and, ones and through the, the neighborhood. Down, and for the downtown traffic that's, that's coming across, everybody goes that way because they don't have to deal with going down into the river valley. So linking to that, I think, is, you know, for anybody coming from the south, um, and I suspect it's a fair, I mean, I stood there on the corner, and, you know, even at even non-rush hour, there were 10 bikes going in both directions, east, west, and north, south, with every light change. So, um, so very, I'm just... Very busy place. Yeah, so... Uh, it would be nice to know that we we got that into our thinking. I think there may be some arterial, you know, just as much as we got the north-south arterials on the downtown piece, I think we've heard, and I think it's more than just the 104th piece that's missing there in terms of a decent uh, arterial connection north-south that connects to the high level, that high-level bridge intersection and arguably to the east-west intersection, the east-west traffic that go comes across there as well. Um, it's somehow or other we've got to figure it out. And 109th, I don't think is the answer. If it could be the answer, that'd be great, but I don't think it is. Is this something that you'd like to see as a capital profile in the upcoming I'd, budget? I guess, I'd li I guess the question I would like to ask is how it fits into the, that arterial bike plan, that major route plan, because I think you've got the major routes, the north-south major routes on the downtown side. You don't have them, and I, and I suspect... Right now, hopefully this will change in the future, but right now I'm guessing there's way more use in that area on the south side of the river than there is on the north. So we've dealt with it on the one side of the river, but not on the other in terms of what happens on that other side of the bridge. And I, it'd be nice to know that we'd thought that out in terms of the priority routes. I guess that's my question. Um, I know it probably is in the plan, but I suspect there's some gaps in there. Sure. Okay. Um, and, and just, just for clarity's sake, because I know we keep on raising complete streets, and maybe we need to have further presentation on this, but complete streets isn't a one-size-fits-all. The whole point of complete streets is to understand the context, who might be using a street, and then to adapt to those users, correct? It's not a, an assumption that everybody's going to be using every street. It's also about, just so we have clarity around it, because I hear it right. bandied about as a term, and I think there's some confusion about it, correct? Ms. Ms. Tui, or whoever wants to answer that question. I, I think you're correct. So I, th I think the other issue is it, it seems like complete streets is uh, the interpretation of that is that it's simply to accommodate bikes, which it certainly is not. It's about moving everything from goods to pedestrians. So it's not the, just a bicycle in plan. In the correct context. Okay. Correct street. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Anderson, Councilor Mack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the education campaign side of things, I mean, really, no, ma no matter what we do, we need, to, we need an education campaign, don't we? Yes. <laughs> well, sorry, but there's, this is a major change in the way that roadways are used. So yeah. we need to make sure people know how to do that. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's the idea, the concept behind this education. So it's, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, although there's some money being, that might be spent on it, I mean, we, we need this, whether we do dedicated lanes, multi-use trails, we just need to better educate drivers, cyclists, everyone at how we share the road together. So I think that's a needed part. I just wanted to get your take on that. So you'd be doing that no matter what's going to happen going forward, I think, right? Well, we are doing some. Yeah. What we're asking for is some additional resources to supplement it, because we do have some gaps. Certainly. I wanted to talk a little bit more about since 2009 and the bicycle transportation plan's been approved, 
I think there are some numbers thrown around a little bit and just get a bit more context. Uh, since 2009, how much have we spent approximately um, for cycling infrastructure, which may include multi-use trails as well? I think, do you know offhand? I do happen to know offhand um, <laughs> on a handy dandy spreadsheet. Um, for on-street cycling routes, uh, we didn't do anything in 2009, but from 2010 through to the end of 2013, we spent $3.4 million mm -hmm. to build 65 and a half kilometers of routes. And from 2009 through 2013, we spent just under $11 million, 10.9 and change, uh, to build shared use paths off street. And uh, we built 17.2 kilometers. So in a grand total, we spend 14.3 million to build 82.6 kilometers of routes. Excellent. And I mean, really, the shared youth's paths aren't cycling specific; they're for everyone. Correct. Right? I mean, that's so we've really spent 3.4 million dollars over four years on cycling infrastructure. On street cycling infrastructure. On street cycling. What's our total transportation budget every year? Uh, several several hundred million dollars. Several hundred million. So that's and not. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess I just want to say we're not even spending anywhere close to a proportional, even if we only have, what's our current cycling ridership in the city of Edmonton, what percent? The latest census put it at around 1%. It mm -hmm. depends on which neighborhood you're in. But Strathcona three, has about 5%. Yeah. But anyway. And 3.4 million of a couple hundred million dollar budget, oh, and times by four, we're not even close, we're less than a hundredth of a percent, I think, probably spent, spent on cycling infrastructure. Is that correct? Yes, if you're doing that calculation, we'd be, yeah, we'd be under 1%. Well under, well under 1%. Sure. Okay. Uh, no, so I mean, that, and the reason I ask that is because you are going to be asking for a little more money um, to spend on dedicated cycling infrastructure and more dedicated lanes. But even still, I imagine, although you don't have the cost right now and you're going to bring it forward, it's probably still not going to be 1% of our total transportation budget, I would imagine. I mean, that is part and parcel of the public consultation to determine yeah. what first, you know, once we know where the route is, what is the appropriate route type, mm -hmm. and then the associated costs. And that really ranges anywhere from $10,000 a kilometer if we're just mm -hmm. doing sharrows, yeah. which we heard today is not what everyone really wants, up to, uh, you know, they're spending about a million dollars a kilometer on, on protected bike lanes or so-called cycle tracks in Calgary. Okay. No, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McKean. Thank you very much. I'm hoping that someone today, whether it's you folks or Mr. Wanzura, could give me some comfort, and it's following up on Councillor Henderson's comments about neighborhood renewal and complete streets. The community of Westmont right now is running as fast as it can to get the, um, the lighting survey done. And I met with them last week, and that's where it came up. They had no idea what complete streets is. I don't think they've thought about bike lanes. My concern is that they're so pressed right now that they might sort of miss an opportunity, and we might assume something and then, and then create a debacle. So can you give me any comfort that there's not going to be deadlines missed for them, that they're going to have proper consultation on bike lanes, complete streets, in a process that demands a lot of a community. Um, Councillor McKean, our intention is to launch um, a more thorough consultation on the bike routes on 127th this fall. Okay, so that, okay. So, so that would, um, because it, it needs to connect to other areas, we want to have a, a larger process. You can't speak to the complete streets pilot though. Councillor McKean, the co a complete streets pilot is throughout Westmount. Very specifically, we looked at 127th Street and we're pulling that out as kind of a unique um, corridor because it extends beyond just Westmount and we want to encourage uh, consultation beyond Westmount when we determine what should be along 127th Street. So the idea for timing is that uh, the neighborhood renewal happens over a couple of years, so that would be in the latter part of the okay. neighborhood renewal construction. So we, what I guess I'm getting at is we wouldn't have finished construction and then the community 
would want something, then we would have to tear stuff up or we would have to tell them at that point it's too late. You should have said something earlier. That's we, are, we are specifically looking at 127th Street, which is the uh, bike lane now, which is the so bike the corridor now. Complete and Streets Pilot is just that? No, the Complete Streets is looking at a number of different areas, and uh, um, a couple of reports from now we'll talk about the update and just give you an overview of Westmount, and we could talk to it then. Yeah, and I know that, uh, like I said, I think uh, Councillor Henderson making the same point. The Community League itself is is strapped right now. They're really sort of feeling under siege, I think, about all the stuff they have to do to meet deadlines for us. And, uh, and I would hope that we would bend over backwards to help them out on those sorts of questions, especially so they don't miss out on an opportunity to, uh, to give their local knowledge on complete streets and on the bike lanes because my email inbox will then fill up. And, and I just don't want it to be too late. So you're, you think right, we're, going to, we're going to be okay? We are working with them to, to look at very specific areas where those kind of elements come in. For instance, building a sidewalk where there is none or um, the road width and taking a look at those ev every specific block for specific questions and going in and uh, addressing those. Uh, well, it gives me some comfort knowing that there's a bike group that is formed out there uh, involving uh, uh, Michael Fair. So that gives me some comfort, too. I'm happy to see that today. Um, and he brought up the idea of attractiveness. I thought it was, an, I hadn't really, to be honest, thought about it. I was thinking utility, safety, routes, those sorts of things. Is that, a, is that something we're talking to the neighborhoods about? Is it something that we've really contemplated in, in this plan? Yeah, for the, for the major bike grid or the major routes, the fifth stage of the consultation, if memory serves, is about aesthetics. How do we, once we know functionally where it's going to be, how do we, how do we improve the aesthetics? Is there light poles that we can do? Is there landscaping that can improve the aesthetics? Um, is there artwork? Is there public art racks or something like that that can enhance what these corridors are? You know, I think the report is about bike routes, but a lot of the communities that you heard today, it's, it's, mu it's about much more than that to them. It's about the vibrancy and the livability of their neighborhoods, and we're just working on a single corridor. It happens to be initiated by bikes, but it's really looking to do more improvements than just for the cyclists. One last thing. Uh, we uh, certainly have heard that there will be demand, higher demand in the core, because there are more cyclists in, in, in uh, Ward 8 and 6. Did I get that number right? Um, and do we know that? Do we, have we done the surveys? Do we know that to be true? Again, just to give me some comfort here, that there are more, there's more demand in uh, the downtown area, Oliver, Westmount, Glenora, and that's, such. That that's would that's correct, yeah. Okay, we've done the surveys. Thank you, Councillor Caterina. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, uh, the grid uh, that you're showing here in the report, um, it says that location and type of bicycle infrastructure for each route is uh, um, not currently known. Uh, the one I'm interested in is uh, uh, the 119th uh, Ave from Nate to 82nd Street. So that's being proposed here in red. What does that mean? That means that the uh, bicycle transportation plan had designated that as being the location for an east-west route through those to serve those neighborhoods in the shopping district of 118th Avenue, Albert Avenue. So it's a starting point uh, based on the on the bike plan. The f when consultation would start for that route, we would be gathering information just like we are for the route through Old Strathcona. We'd be looking at parallel routes to that to serve generally the same area. So no consultation has been done yet on this particular one? Not Never currently. to the community? Uh, there was some consultation, I believe, has started as part of neighborhood renewal for the, and forgive me for not knowing the neighborhood name, but I believe the, the community at the farthest west uh, portion of that is undergoing neighborhood renewal right now. That's Bruce Avenue? Uh, I, Westwood. Westwood? Westwood? Yeah. And this also involves Alberta Avenue? It yes. also invo involves Eastwood. Correct. I would think that you would know the communities you're going through. So looking at that one there, uh, have you guys looked at that actual street? 
we have done no design work and no consultation on this yet. Okay, because I'd be interested to see how you would get from 106 to 90 through 97th Street. Yes, there's a big berm there. There's a big berm and an alley. Yeah. And then 97th Street is a six, eight lane yeah. roadway. And then you keep going east and there's cement medians put there 25 years ago in order to uh, uh, stop shortcutting. Correct. And then you get to 93rd Street and there's a park. Yep. So it's all part what, of the design what process. What's the intent of getting I, through uh, the berm, getting across 97th Street? There's lots of different design options and opportunities, but it all hinges on public consultation. They have to tell us where the route's going to be located and how we're going to navigate some of those barriers. Okay. Just out of curiosity, why, why would uh, you pick that particular area? route? Area. No, not area, but route. Uh, 100, uh, 117th Avenue is actually much easier. 119th Avenue had a lot of work done as part of the bike plan to, to determine that that would be the east-west route. But that, that's just a starting point. It could very well end up being 117th Avenue if that, through the consultation, is a better route. Okay, well, that's what I'm asking. How do you come up with the rationale when you're looking at this that you would take 119th as the preferred one uh, right. where it's much more difficult than 117th? There was a lot of... accomplishing the Yeah, there, there was a number of different criteria as part of the bike plan that looked to, to weigh different route options. Okay, when uh, is consultation scheduled? We have not scheduled anything because we need to okay. get budget approval to and move forward And with the consultation process, there's going to be some changes you've said. Uh, specifically, uh, so th this is outlined here on a map, so I would assume that's the one you prefer. So the consultation is, uh, do they want a bike path or not, or you're going to ask them to consult on uh, tweaking what you've already decided on? We're going to do consultation on route options. So, um, for example, down in Strathcona, we had 83rd no, I'm talking Avenue. talking about this one. So what would be the option to this? You're going to go out to the community and say, this is what we think is a good route. What do you think? We don't know what the route options are because we have not done any work on it yet. So your guess is as good as mine right now. It could range from anything. For instance, 83rd Avenue, and I know you don't want to talk about that one, but that one we went from 81st Avenue, 82nd, 83rd, and 84th are options that we're looking at. For this one, if I had to just throw to something here right now, we'd be looking at 117th, 118th, 119th, and possibly 120th. Okay. So no, no idea of when uh, consultation, because now that this is in front of us today, uh, I'm sure that uh, the three different communities involved are going to react and start to ask questions. Yeah, the decision point on the routes is really with council as part of the budget deliberations. Each, each of these routes, uh, as per the color codes, will have a capital profile as part of the capital budget. So during that time, if council decides to fund the quote-unquote 119th Avenue route, knowing that we would be doing consultation on where it's located, we would then uh, put together a plan and, and determine schedule when that would happen. Okay, well, I would suggest you're premature in identifying this at this point where you haven't consulted with anybody at this point. And to be honest with you, this is the first time I've seen that route. I don't think you ever called me up and said we're contemplating. It's on the bike plan. It's on the bike plan? Oh, yeah. The big bike plan, lots of lines. I missed it. Yeah, that one's designated as a bicycle boulevard as per the bike plan. Okay. Um, you heard from one of the speakers that... Uh, uh, tra tra Traffic Safety Act uh, bicycles are vehicles. So I'm very you, well aware of that, yes. You can confirm that? That's correct. Okay, so as vehicles, uh, do they require insurance? Under provincial legislation, they do not require insurance or registration. Or registration or helmets like motorcyclists. Helmets are required for users up to the age of 16, I believe. Or, or below the age of so 16? With the bike path and everything else, uh, we've talked a lot about education. Uh, has there been any enforcement, su substantial enforcement at this point, uh, all these years on... We can come to a close, Councillor. ...riding on sidewalks, that sort of thing? There is enforcement uh, about people riding on sidewalks, specifically downtown in the Old Strathcona area, is where uh, enforcement has been most diligent. Okay, I'd be interested okay. to see what... Thank you. Again. Okay, so we have uh, no other questions. So we have... 
the, mo the main motion or the main or the motion we could make the recommendation in the report I'll move the recommendation in 6.1 okay so and then we have help me out here as a subsequent motions thank you the we just put those we can move those now no, or we need to deal with this one okay I'll just put them up okay we can put up the uh, deal with this one So does anyone want to speak to the recommendations once they're up? <laughs> Dare I ask? If you can vote on the motion as is in the report first, and then we'll put up the subsequent. Okay. So any speakers, or are we just going to? Okay, so I'll uh, call the question. I, oh. I just want to make sure in doing this, because part of this plan also speaks to how we're doing with the neighborhood renewal piece in terms of the public consultation piece. So are we going to, in passing this, do we still get to go back and, I guess, is we a have a, to Ms. Tui? We have a subsequent about that, Councillor Henderson. Okay. All right. So you'll see that in a second. Okay. So I'll, and I'll call the question on the uh, recommendation in the report. All those in favor? Okay, it's carried. Thank you. So if we can see the subsequents. If you could start, uh, deal with them individually. Okay, so the first one, motion one, that the administration provide a report to Transportation Committee on the engagement of communities regarding bike lane infrastructure as part of the neighborhood renewal process. So, uh, Councillor Esslinger, speak to that, please. Certainly, I think we've heard loud and clear that neighborhoods are going through this renewal process aren't clear that they have an option to talk about bike lanes. They don't know when they can be engaged. They don't know, and we need to clarify as part of this report who is being engaged and when. We heard Councillor Henderson talk about is it at the community leagues or at the greater stage. So I'm hoping through this process we can understand and be able to articulate to communities this is the process around bike lanes in your neighborhood as part of the renewal process and that they'll also have an idea that they can impact not only on the location but the type. So that's the kind of information I'm looking for here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McKean. This uh, might be redundant, but the uh, I wondered if, we, if it would be required to add the words at the very end and complete streets pilot process. Now, I don't know if they're always going together, uh, but I just, it may be superfluous. Maybe they're always tied in, but that's my one concern. Ms. Tui, you have a comment on that? I, I think that's a good idea to talk about it as one process. Let's take a look at how do we bring forward that, that process consistently through the neighborhood renewal. Okay, so... so Yes, I think that would be a good idea that it, rather than have them separately, that it's not just a focus on bikes, that we talk about the bigger process. So, in, for instance, walkability in addition to, you know, not just focus on bike lanes, but the walkability opportunities, those kinds of things. How do we bring that into the neighborhood renewal process in a more robust way? So, okay. in terms of what you want to put in there, complete streets, yes, add the words. Fine. So, clarifying question, Councillor Essinger, quickly. Sorry, and then... I just want to... Uh, I understand the complete streets process, but some neighborhoods are going through neighborhood renewal, but they're not going through a complete streets process. I want to make sure I understand what those neighborhoods who are not in the complete street process are also getting. So we need to make sure it's clear. So the and or will help us. Okay. Okay. Does that maintain, okay, Councillor? Well, my question was linked, and, I, and I'm wondering if there's another way out of this, because my experience has been in one of my neighborhoods, it was, it's one of my neighborhoods, it's about active transportation in general, right? So, and I think that was the situation in Glenora, right? So it was not just about the bike lanes, it was also about sidewalks and walking and, and being able to make improvements to those conditions, which can't, you know, I mean, we're using complete streets. I just worry about complete streets because it means so many different things to different people. And, and uh, so I, I, for me, I think the, the piece, and it may be inappropriate to bring that as a subsequent now because we're talking about bike lanes, but it really was about that ability to talk about pedestrian safety, tr you know, intersection safety, all those, and bike lanes. And that's what I'm hearing, that they want to be able to get into the process earlier. 
Right. And so what I'm seeing in this motion, and you can maybe reflect back if what I'm understanding you correctly, what I think we need to do is to bring back to you how we could improve our processes so that we can get earlier into the communities to talk about whether it's walkability, bike, or complete streets really means you know, a, a combination of those things. But it's, it, what our look is, is how do we improve our existing process and, and, I, I, and how can we, you know, be more proactive in it? Is that what your intention is? I think it captures the, in, the intention. I, I just want to make sure that we're, we understand how to communicate to neighborhoods what's going to happen because they feel they didn't know they could ask about bike lanes and then they've missed that opportunity and they wish they had that conversation and so that's part of the information that I think we need to understand. Okay, Councillor Anderson. Well, I think what we don't want to do is tell them how we're going to do something to them. <laughs> that's what we want to do is engage them in what we're going to do in their neighborhood. Um, does, I like what you said about how you're going to make sure that your process fully engages people so that they understand what is planned and what could be planned as their neighborhood is, is renovated. And what I'm hearing also, and I think I've experienced, is, is part of its timeline um, for, well, when do we need to do this so that there's actually enough time to go through this process so that you don't have that rushed feeling of, okay, we now have to make these decisions. So what is it that we need to do reasonably with, with the number of neighborhoods that we're doing that we give enough lead time uh, to consider all of these elements? Personally, I think that it should occur at least the year before you plan, you plan on, on the renovation in a neighborhood. But can we just adjust? That's the current process is one year before. Can we make just a minor adjustment that the administration provide a report to Transportation Committee on how they plan on fully engaging communities regarding? And how they that means that they're going to reevaluate what they're doing and they're going to make adjustments to make sure that there is both timeliness and involvement by communities when they're going to have a neighborhood renewal process. Councilor Essinger, it's your motion. What do you think? I like the idea of how we're going to plan to it, doing it. Does that mean that what we're doing right now is inadequate and we're going to change it? So what's going to happen to those communities going through it? I would suggest that the whole idea of this report was to find out, well, is, is it adequate or do we need to adjust our processes and what could we do? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Caterina. A clarification uh, on, on the first one uh, tied to the neighbourhood renewal process. So um, these lanes uh, take in different communities. They, they cross borders on that, but uh, not all community revitalizations, uh, renewals happen contiguously like that. So you might have the first portion being scheduled for one time and the last portion might not even be scheduled in this next cycle. So how, how, do, you, how do you see this working uh, as far as the, the good example is uh, Westwood, Alberta Avenue and Eastwood. They're not all scheduled for the same Mm -hmm. year for neighborhood renewal. So how, how would this address that? And for, for the second motion there, are you looking at this as a standalone report strictly uh, to do with bike lanes on snow removal or would this be part of uh, the snow removal program? Well, we would. I think maybe we'll we'll beef that. that up a little bit to report on the pilot project. I think that um, we talked about it being a memo report, but I think it's more complicated than just a memo, and I think it's worth debating here at committee. So we can get to that when we get to that one. So, is there an answer to Councillor Katarina's question about the different neighborhoods and different schedules? Councillor, I don't have the answer to that. I would have to investigate that. Can I 
Yeah. Can I finish my five minutes that I had earlier? I thought you were finished. I apologize. No, that's okay. But now you're cutting into it. Let me finish mine yeah. first, and then you, you finish, can finish it. yours uh, after that. So, uh, with with motion two, it, it, we've already had the snow report. On number one. We were dealing with these in order. Okay. So, so there's no answer for my question. They don't have an answer. So when you find an answer, you can you might want to uh, give it to council. Uh, motion two. Uh, this now so would be a standalone. We're going to come back around to motion two. One round per per motion. So thank you. So I'll put you on the list for the second motion. Councillor Anderson. I, I was just going to say that that. We bring up neighborhood renewal because that is the extenuating circumstance to a general bike route plan. It's unique. If a neighborhood is going to have a, a renewal occur, there are things that are possible there that might not be possible in neighborhoods that are not being renewed. So this, you know, in terms of Councillor Katarina's uh, situation. There's going to be lots of consultation in neighborhood one and three that aren't ha having renewal occur uh, about where they want the routes to go, et cetera, et cetera. But if there is renewal in neighborhood two on a contiguous uh, bike route, there may be things that can occur in that neighborhood simply because there's going to be massive tear up and, 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 and lay down. So it doesn't necessarily have to have renewal in all three. Correct. I think 127th Street uh, that runs through Westmount and Inglewood is an example. Inglewood doesn't have renewal going on right now, but we, we're pulling that corridor out because it is a long continuous, and in this case, an existing corridor that we can consult on as a separate consultation process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Further questions on this motion? So uh, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Okay, motion carried. Uh, second motion. Uh, anyone on committee? You, you, want, you want to move it? Well, yeah, I want to change it, thank you, to provide a report, Transportation Committee, on the winter pilot. Whatever it was called. We'll just. It was the 106th Street bike route winter slash spring maintenance pilot project. Okay. It's a mouthful. We'll call it that. Uh, so the mayor was going to move it. So it's mo moved by the mayor. Okay, questions, committee? Okay, Councillor Katarina and then Councillor Nick. No, it's fine if it's uh, to the pilot because this is a standalone. We've had the snow report. Yeah. Uh, Already, this wasn't part of it, uh, mm -hmm. so talking okay. about the pilot is is fine. Okay. Mr. Yeah, I think I think the intent is we get the report back, see how it went, what did we learn from it, and then eventually that marries back up with the big policy discussion because yes. the policy is coming back in the fall. So, okay. Council, you're good. Okay, let's call the question. All in favor? Motion carried. The third one too, if you want. Okay. And I'll move the third one, which is the administration consider north-south connections to the 83rd Avenue route and bring recommendations to the Transportation Committee on any revisions to the uh, ISTP. What's the ISTP? You wrote that. I thought, oh, oh, that's <laughs> my handwriting. The I is actually a B. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> bicycle transportation plan. Bicycle transportation plan. Because, the, the, like I said, the, this map here doesn't show us all the other pieces. So when you bring us the report on this, there are some existing pieces and show us how those work. And then when you're doing the consultation, this allows you, in my, in my understanding, this would allow you to hear from the community about recommendations for what works and what doesn't work for north-south. And, uh, and then you can bring us some recommendations about because I think the grid on the, the downtown routes grid piece works really well on the north side, and I know there's pieces that aren't on this map on the south side. So show us how that's all going to work, and whether we maybe need to think about changing something, and then then those options could come to committee. So that's that's the intent behind the motion. Did you guys have a thought for wording for clarity? 
No, I just, I, I guess I just want to be clear as part of the consultation for the east west route through Old Strathcona, are we, is the intention to add uh, the review of 104th Street? Not explicitly. Okay. I think what, I think if you're going to be talking to people anyway about how that's going to work, this allows you to be open to suggestions which you can bring back to us along with your recommendations. And then we can weigh whether those are good or bad, or, and you can give your technical. So it's not, it doesn't predetermine that 104th is the way to go. This just says be open to that as well as the other options, and then bring us some recommendations that address the high-level community concern, which is how do you move easily north and south to connect to this east-west thing as well as to major destinations in that area. Because, um, and so that's that's that's, that's what I'm looking at. Based on, based on the input, input we had from the speakers today. Okay. Well, Councillor Henderson. Well, I guess as a question, I mean, I mean, we know that Garneau, I think, is, come, is actually sooner rather than later on the list for neighbourhood renewal, and that would, have, that would affect that one-tenth corridor that's already there but is not working very well. So I would assume that if we can get ahead of that one, um, I think if we can do that and understand if it's important or not, if it's the best place for it, I think that's another key one. And then really understanding what we're doing with the 106 one as well, um, which is in there already, but it's not, I would argue, at that, as it goes through Strathcona on our 23rd, not functioning the way we anticipated it to be. So, I mean, you and I both rode down it, and we know how impassable it was. So, Good. Just to close and to agree with Councilor yes. Henderson, I think part of this would be about opportunities to align with neighborhood renewal in these areas as it comes to. So... Um, so just to be open to that at, uh, at this point, so. Okay. Okay. So call the question. All in favor of uh, the motion number three on the screen. Motion carried. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the work. Thank you for the shift in focus. Uh, appreciate it. And we will be back at 345. 346.
Calling Councillor Anderson. I should really run it. Someone pry Councillor Anderson away from the media, please. Rhonda, can we deal with the next two to together? This is all ba oh, oops, basic. We just need the mayor or Councillor Anderson. Okay, well, I'll call the meeting back to order. Thank you, Councillor Knack, for being present. Okay, 6.2 and 6.3 will be dealt with together. So take it away. All right, I'm Rhonda Tui from Transportation Planning Branch, and I'm here with Ainsley Brown, and she's going to uh, talk about complete streets. We have two separate presentations because we have two separate reports, and uh, one's more specific than the other, but they are both about complete streets. So the first uh, topic is about uh, 142nd Street planning study. And why are we here today? Because we don't normally bring you a planning study, but what we're looking for is to get some counselor guidance on how we're interpreting policy. Is this, uh, is this meeting with your expectation for how we're applying uh, policy to our projects? So the 142nd Street re Renewal Project is scheduled for 2015 construction. So this planning study gives us an opportunity to use a Complete Streets pilot as a test for this particular project. And the idea of the planning study is to look at accommodating all modes of travel along this section of arterial. Um, as you can see, there are several constraints along the 142nd Street corridor. There's an EPCOR substation with a wall right close to the, to the uh, roadway. There's big trees, there's power lines, and there are no sidewalks or bicycle facilities. 
The design team met with a stakeholder group to work on some options to accommodate all modes of transportation and narrowed it down to two concept plans that we want to bring forward. So just to highlight, the first concept um, looks at taking away one southbound lane from 124th to 118th Avenue in order to construct a boulevard sidewalk all the way along the west side. There is a shared use path on the east side and this requires some modifications to 118th Avenue. And the second concept is there's no change to the southbound lanes for most of the way along the corridor, but then uh, you can't provide a west side sidewalk all the way along. Have provided transit connections, so little um, pads and connectors out to the next uh, intersection from the transit zones. And again, on the east side, uh, shared use path, which also requires some modification to 118th Avenue. Just to clarify what 118th Avenue modifications are, it's um, dropping a southbound lane right at the intersection in order to have a shared use path on the east side, both north and south of 118th Avenue where there's constraints because of the Epcor substation and the 7-Eleven store. So when we consider the idea of taking uh, away a travel lane, we look at, well, how can we do this? The traffic volume along 142nd Street is quite modest. So it's about 12,000 vehicles a day right now, and the predictions are in the future that it doesn't grow a lot, and that's because of uh, the future um, constraints at Yellowhead Trail. If you look at this in comparison with some other arterial roadways, it's in the range of about half of the vehicle volume of other arterials. So while there are, um, like any road, there's some peak demands that the uh, travel demand, traffic demand can easily be accommodated on the proposals. In order to look at what uh, options should be um, recommended, we looked at a number of comparisons and a number of criteria. So this is a really good pictorial um, illustration of, of the various modes that we're accommodating as well as the, the cost. And if you look there, there's a little line on life cycle costing just to, to highlight that. So if you look at this, it looks like concept one provides the, um, the best accommodation of all of those uh, criteria. But when we're looking at concept plans, we also consider a balance of our policy, our technical requirements, as well as the stakeholder feedback. So when we look at these options, um, there is no clear-cut stakeholder feedback positive or negative on, on any of the concepts, but on concept one, there's certainly more negative uh, feedback than there is in concept two. So while concept one provides the best policy alignment, um, our recommendation is a balance of um, policy, technical requirements, and stakeholder input, and we're suggesting that option two be um, moved forward with. And so why we're here now is to seek some council direction on, on our interpretation of policy because by making this recommendation it means that there would not be a complete sidewalk along the west side of 142nd Street. Uh, if we were to provide a complete sidewalk it would mean removing one travel lane which can be accommodated but the the general perception of the public is it's quite negative. So that's where we're looking at some guidance from Council to uh, determine of our interpretation and how we balance those things. And further, if we're going to talk about, you wanted to do these two together, so we're going to talk about just a general update on what we've been doing um, for Complete Streets, and we'll just get another presentation here. So the purpose of today's Complete Streets Implementation Report is to provide an update on the implementation phases since the policy was improved, but also to discuss the next steps for implementation. Thank you. 
Complete Streets policy is intended to shift the way that we design the streets from a rigid design of from a rigid design standard to a more flexible approach. This flexible, flexible approach will acknowledge that one size does not fit all in terms of roadway design. The associated complete street guideline guides the development of a network of streets that serve all users and provides design options that consider the context of the surrounding area, dependent on function, land use context, and building orientation. The Complete streets, streets Guideline has initiated the change and now it is through the implementation process that we will realize Complete Streets in Edmonton. Implementation will occur through continued and ongoing collaboration with key internal and external stakeholders. We are currently in the piloting and evaluating stage of preliminary implementation. There are several current implementation steps underway. The first is the Greenfield Cross Sections Project. With this project was undertaken to allow for the use of complete streets, but also to provide off-the-shelf designs that wouldn't lengthen approval process timelines. For this project, a process was set up to guide internal and external stakeholders to develop cross-sections that met the complete streets principles, and a cost efficiency analysis was, was completed. The cost efficiency analysis showed that with the increased range of options offered by Complete Streets, there was an associated range in cost as well. However, overall, the cost increase averaged at about 1%. There were two arterial renewal pilots chosen as Complete Streets pilots. The first was 112th Avenue. For 112th Avenue, the Complete Streets guidelines provided the design team with enough flexibility to balance the needs of the commuters using the roadway and, and as well as area residents and businesses. The project team for 142nd Street used the Complete Streets guidelines to develop multiple options, which we are looking at separately today. One stage of, Grease, of the Griesbond neighborhood is also being designed as a Complete Streets pilot. In Griesbaum, much innovation has been introduced. However, the last remaining challenges lie in the unique nature of the designs proposed by the applicant and some of the existing standards which, which, limits, which limit flexibility. As we've spoken about also today, the Westmount neighborhood is a uh, pilot in the, in the neighborhood renewal process. The neighborhood renewal pilot in Westmount is allowing us to explore how complete streets will be incorporated into the neighborhood renewal process. We have broadened public involvement in Westmount by introducing an additional public meeting. And with complete streets, we have increased design options that are being considered beyond simply replacing the existing infrastructure. The last project that I'm going to speak about is the priority network maps. Administration is working to develop these maps to outline the most important areas and routes for the five modes, cycling, transit, auto, goods movement, and pedestrians. These maps will help administration and road designers determine priority modes and make trade-offs along corridors. In terms of next steps, we can, as we continue to implement complete streets, we'll be working on a number of other phases. We will be working on updating complete streets, the, upstre the complete streets guidelines annually based on what we've learned in the pilot projects and throughout implementation. We will be adding an addendum to the existing design and construction standards to include the complete streets cross sections which we have generated. We have also a list of projects and initiatives highlighted in the pilot projects and through implementation so far that we will be undertaking. Education and outreach will be for both external and internal stakeholders is going to be a critical component as we move forward with implementation. And administration is also developing a request for funding for complete streets enhancements. Stepped implementation will include continued collaboration with stakeholders, further testing of the guidelines, and ongoing evaluation. Thank you. That completes our presentation. Thank you, folks. <clears throat> I appreciate it. So we have uh, speakers now that uh, will come up. So Lyle Falk. Is Mr. Falk, if you could take the first chair, Elaine Solez, uh, and Peter Moore. Is Mr. Moore here? 
Oh, if you can come up and take the third chair. Now we're dealing with both of these together, so. I'm not sure how to address that because I have a whole. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah, we'll just ask uh, the clerk to. Let's go through all the presentations for 6.2, and then we'll go through the presentations for 6.3. Thank you. By allowing. Okay. When does my time start? Now. Okay, I'm talking about the 142 set Street Concept Planning Study. Why I'm here, I'm a commuter, a motorist, a pedestrian, and a cyclist, but a cyclist only from May to September. I'm being impacted negatively by the pilot projects that remove traffic lanes on arterial roadways or on the 142 Street recommended proposal that adds a bottleneck, increasing congestion and commute times. My request to the committee, all of these apply to 142. I ask that the two lane, the, the option that's being presented uh, the two lanes in each direction be modified so that it does not have a bottleneck at 118th Avenue and 142 Street. This proposal takes away a northbound left turning lane, right turning lane, and two through lanes and reduces it to one through lane. I think this is unacceptable. To ask this committee to re I'm also asking this committee to reject proposals, both pilot and other, that create bottlenecks and reduce traffic flow. I'm asking you to accept projects that increase flow and reduce congestion. Conge congestion. To have the sewer upgrades done on this project before repaving the roadway and then ripping it up and paving it a second time, because sewer is part of this project. Uh, I ask that the shared use path not reduce any of the existing lane space and put the shared use path in the green space, which is really a road right of way uh, off of it. And also you could use the back alley that uh, parallels there that's lit. Um, and I mentioned that to the engineers. They said that some users are not comfortable lighting using a lit back alley paralleling a major artery, yet they haven't even counted the number of cyclists in the area, at least not at the public meeting. So here's the issues with the 142 Street proposals. The stated proposal is to repave the road, but this option is not even presented as the community as a proposal. This is a Trojan horse to implement more expensive, less user-friendly proposal for 98% of the road users. The complete streets guide is used as justification when this was pointed out at the public meeting. The plan to repave the road, which is not on the table as a solution, I say bring that, repaving that back and ask for feedback on that option, but that was never done. Number three, congestion affects all road users, including transit users, cars, and trucks. Vehicles cannot pass a traffic accident, a slow moving vehicle, or a stop bus in any of the one lane proposals or two lane proposals, which introduce a bottleneck. For this item, I asked how many bikes and vehicles and cyclists there's, first of all, they said there was 12,000 uh, cars per day on here, yet I found a city document, the, 19, the 2013 traffic flow map, says there's 14,300 average annual weekday traffic flow on this segment. The public meeting said 12,000. Um, so they might want to up their, their numbers. Secondly, the number of pedestrians were counted. There's 100 pedestrians. The number of cyclists were not counted, and yet they're redesigning a road without data to back it. This solution caters to 1% to 2%, not the majority that one would expect. Facts not recognized. Congestion costs everyone time and money. The Tom Max Traffic Index, which is a database of historic travel times, shows Edmonton traffic congestion is increasing. Edmonton congestion is getting worse, 1% to 5% worse according to this uh, study, depending on, on which quarter of the year you look at, while some cities are getting better. The delay in Edmonton for a 30-minute commute is delayed by 20 minutes, 21 minutes for a, uh, per, per hour versus the free flow times. The complete streets policy is contributing to this congestion increase. One, my recommendations for 142 Street. If you want to do a pilot on 142, put in barriers on an existing road to get real data of how much congestion will increase. Once the road work has been done, it cannot be modified without a redo, which we all know isn't going to happen. Block the lanes as they exist and monitor to see how real-world implementation of complete street guidelines will affect users before spending millions of dollars. Collect the user feedback on the bottlenecks and congestion. 
No options were presented, number two recommendation, no options were presented to widen the street and add a lane like on 149th Street. This could help offset the 149th Street volume. This proposal shifts more traffic to 149th Street and St. Albert Trail when it should offer the opposite. My third recommendation, proposal does not address the unused real estate for six months, the late fall, winter and spring for bicycle lanes. This should also be addressed. When these issues are pointed out to engineers, the response was the complete streets guidelines was approved by council. Uh, I'm also saying to repave the road, but not until after the sewer issues are addressed. Disallow any reduction in lanes for cars, trucks and buses as part of the pilot. Add vehicle, vehicular lanes, don't take them away. And the green space that's right next to it, that's 10 meters wide, is actually zoned as a traffic corridor. So use it for what it's, its intended purposes. And this is just an appendix for uh, we can what, wrap it up, Mr. Falk. what it does. Thank you. Thank you for being so concise. Five minutes on the nose. Good. Ms. Solez. Sorry, good afternoon again. Uh, EFCL supports the complete streets policy and we typically wouldn't be weighing in on a, a project that affects a per, just a particular part of the city. You know, we tend to do, uh, take a look at citywide things and of course complete streets is citywide. Uh, and also, or, or things that affect uh, a majority of community leagues. But one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to come here today, um, in addition to expressing our support for complete streets policy, is to say that we were pleased to see that it's being implemented as a pilot in certain uh, areas of the city to test it out and, and make adjustments to that, uh, that guideline. Um, and, uh, and that it's being used in this particular area because that street is on the bike network, but there's no cycling infrastructure on it or along it. There are no sidewalks, you know, so it speaks to a number of, of council policies, not only clean, complete streets, but also walkability. Um, and in particular, um, the approach that was used here to hold workshops for community members to present options for consideration, gather feedback, and consider all modes of travel uh, is certainly a far cry from the way arterial rehab planning has been done in the past. And I only need to mention the word 99th Street and everybody will know what I'm talking about, I think. Um, so council is to be commended for um, uh, passing that policy and administration for um, uh, starting to implement it in uh, through a pilot uh, project. The um, EFCL recognizes that option one in this uh, proposal reflects, best reflects the needs of all users, uh, all modes of travel, and best reflects council policy. And the public reaction to option one and the fact that option two does, you know, uh, still there, people have concerns about it. Uh, suggests that greater uh, public involvement and education uh, may be needed as well as I think it indicates the difficulties of retrofitting um, uh, when older in infrastructure in established areas when there are constraints, like there, there are various constraints here. But one of the things we really like about this proposal is that the cycling infrastructure, except for um, that 118th Avenue intersection where the EPCOR building is, that it's off-road, that it's um, on a shared use, use, uh, shared use path on the east side, and that uh, we feel that that's a safer way of doing uh, the infrastructure and is more that high quality cycling infrastructure that was talked about in 6.1. Okay, thank you so much. We are on 6.2, so we'll do questions on 6.2 and then we'll, you're speaking, uh, Mr. Moore, you're speaking to 6.3, correct? So we'll start with you on 6.3, just to be fair. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor Esslinger on 6.2. Yes, Ms. Solez, I just have a question. Um, were you a participant in, in the okay. process to get to these recommendations? I did not participate in the workshop. I, you know, that was something that they wanted to hold 
to the community. They didn't want to open it, you know, wider, and I and I respected that. I did attend the open house, and I heard, you know, in, in those open houses, there's a, you know, there are poster boards and then a presentation and Q&A, and then it's all repeated. So I didn't stay for the repeated part. So I, I went to one half of the open house. Okay. And so I heard some of the feedback. And I understand that the workshops were not particularly well attended, which is unfortunate. I also understand that the department did a lot of outreach to the community to tell them about the workshops and the plan, and that a lot of the people attending the open house were hearing about the plans for the first time, and so were somewhat surprised about it. But I also talked to the communi Dover Court Community League, and they um, hadn't heard too much one way or another, um, and weren't uh, particularly concerned. So the Community League, uh, in your conversations, they supported their recommendations, or you were they were no, supporting they were, the process? They, I'm unclear. No, they they were. Um, they knew that they the consultations had been going on, but they weren't. Uh, you know, they, it wasn't anything that was on their radar particularly. Okay, I'll ask that of administration. Thank you, and Mr. Falk, um, were you able to attend the consultations or the open house? Yes, I did. I just missed you, apparently. <laughs> um, yes, I, I was went to there. the second session. Okay, I was at the first one. Now, did you participate in the smaller uh, group sessions or just the open house? Um, I, I only became aware of this uh, because of a flyer in my mom's mailbox. Okay. And uh, so I, I think on about April the 30th or just around then is when I even became aware of, uh, of this whole process and the complete street. And I didn't know anything about complete streets until I delved into this. So, um, But I, I, if you're talking about other workshops, I went to the one at the Dover Court Community Hall yeah. on May the, I can't remember, okay. the 5th or something. The one you were at. Yep. Okay, I, I'll ask you other questions through the administration. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, nothing. Mr. Mack. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Falk, you had mentioned uh, in your request to committee the proposal takes away a northbound left turning lane. And well, I just sorry, did I miss that? Because it doesn't look like it does based off the concept sorry, they're showing. It's, one lane is being taken out. I'll, I've got the, the administrator, they just provided it in their yeah. thing, so I can flip. That's what I was looking at. So I see that they're, they're, sh they're condensing well, right, it as they... Right now there's two, two, two through, one right, one left, and I, at least one of those is going away. On the uh, northbound, it shows... That's on, that's on the north... Uh, that stay, stays, but it's the southbound that's changing a little bit. Um, Right, I apologize. No, that's okay. I just wanted to be clear. Um, now, the other question I had is that because, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of talk about Yellowhead switching to, a, you know, a true freeway. Yep. So, I mean, there will come a point where nobody will be able to access 142nd off the Yellowhead, at which point, I mean, traffic could be... I heard it was going to be right right only I mean, or something it, it, right like in but I, that, that would even cut a significant amount coming through there so i'm just wondering have you i mean when you when you sort of put together your proposal did you consider that and sort of the I, impact? um i did actually yeah, because yeah. um you'll you know you'll find that uh in terms of the numbers yeah. the pedestrians is 100 and 118th avenue and 142 they counted those okay yeah so one per less, and the cyclists haven't even counted, so we don't even know how many are there. I can tell you it's probably not very many. Yeah. So you, what you're, what, what's being proposed is a reduction of 50% of, um, of the capacity of the southbound uh, lane is being proposed for 1% or one to, let's say two, let's say tops, 2% of the users. So unless the traffic went from 14,000 to 7,000 I don't know if that'll happen or not but yeah I think I mean I, I'm not a, I don't know what happens with this I'm I'm just a guy that commutes and gets angry when there's less lanes and I got to sit in traffic longer yeah no no understandable and just yeah I think there's going to be pretty dramatic shifts so I'll talk to the men when, when they come up about that Madam Clerk, we might have, it's a little clunky, but. Now, if you start with uh, Mr. Moore. Okay, and then we'll bring admin back up for both after. Yes. Thank you for the guidance. So, 6.3. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, Mayor Iverson, Chair, members of Council. 
<clears throat> My name is Peter Moore. I'm a principal with IBI Group in our Edmonton office. Uh, and I'm here, I'm also the chair of UDI Transportation Committee, and I'm here to present UDI's position on the proposed uh, complete streets guidelines for greenfield development. <clears throat> Excuse me. As part of the complete streets process, members of UDI and their firms, including myself, were involved with the city and other industry and interest groups in the preparation of the complete street guidelines that are now here ready for implementation. In order to minimize the amount of time to design and approve new cross-sections, example cross-sections were developed by the groups. The consultation process that produced the example greenfield cross-sections and efficiency analysis was thorough. Uh, UDI felt that industry was well represented and had an excellent opportunity to provide comments. The complete streets process included 10 formal meetings with stakeholders and numerous sidebar meetings over a seven month period. Uh, UDI would like to acknowledge the excellent work and extraordinary effort of the Transportation Administration Group in tackling this large and complex project. The proposed cross sections will provide a good starting point for the development of appropriate street cross uh, configurations in new subdivisions. However, UDI is concerned with the process by which new complete streets policy will be implemented going forward. The process requires that each new subdivision application, with each new subdivision application, the applicants will submit justification for each and every road cross section to be used within that proposed subdivision. Justification is also required even for those blue book standards which we have been utilizing for many years. Because of the new cross sections, because the new cross sections are not standards but rather guidelines, the interpretation of plans under the new complete streets policy will be subjective and as a result, individual interpretations will certainly vary as to acceptability. If we anticipate that we will have approximately 300 new subdivision applications submitted in the next 12 months, with potentially numerous cross-sections associated with each application, then each and every cross-section will need to be reviewed, not just by the Transportation Department, but also by other affected departments, drainage, parks and rec, HEPCOR, and the shallow utility companies. This is a new process, and as such, there will be undoubtedly a learning curve associated with creating a streamlined process, which will inevitably create delays in the approval of submissions. This implementation is certainly unlikely to speed up approval times in the short term, and the flexibility of groups such as the utilities will be tested during this time. The issues above represent significant risks to the development industry, more so because of the expected medium-term growth trajectory of residential construction in Edmonton. This will add a further strain on an already stretched approval process. UDI is interested in seeing the successful implementation of the new complete streets policy in greenfield development, and we want to work with the city departments to achieve this. However, in order to address the concerns outlined previously, we recommend the following modifications to the implementation of the green, greenfield complete streets policy. One, phased implementation of the new process in a maximum of 20% of greenfield subdivisions for the coming year. This could be accomplished on a voluntary basis or on an, an agreed upon arrangement with the Transportation Department. Create an arbitration process for internal and external disputes conducted through to the, the Development Coordination Group, the City's Development Coordination Group, to ensure a high level trade-off city perspective. There will be conflicts. We're going to need some sort of, of resolution we can rely or the industry is prepared to rely on, on uh, development coordination to facilitate that. And then follow up with, by monitoring results, come back to the Transportation Committee in six months and possibly a 12 months to report on the success and gradually advance the implementation then from the maximum of 20% to hopefully 100% in the following year once the procedures have been established. Section 5.2 of the Complete Streets states that the implementation of Complete Streets guidelines will not commence for greenfield development until the implications of Complete Streets are understood both by the city and the development industry. <clears throat> this statement recognizes the concerns of the industry related primarily to the implementation process, which has yet to be flushed out. We believe that the staged implementation process that we're recommending will help the city, other developers, and their consultants create an effective and hopefully streamlined process for the successful implementation of Complete Streets. By reducing the number of subdivisions to be assessed under Complete Streets initially, we will reduce the added work volume for city departments in the review process and allow all parties to wade through the inevitable learning curve for the new process. 
Staging the implementation will also limit a huge added workload for the individuals tasked with reviewing these cross-sections on behalf of each department. Given the tremendous workloads faced by the individual departments at present, we feel this is a prudent step. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Willis, please. Thank you. Um, EFCL has been involved in various aspects of Complete Streets development over the years, and we appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the Complete Streets cross-section uh, development this uh, past uh, year, and, receive, and of course receiving in, uh, updates at our Planning and Development Committee meetings uh, from transportation staff. And we uh, really commend the multi-stakeholder process that was used to develop and refine the cross-sections. It was a very different kind of, of consultation than has been uh, used previously by administration, and I think it was, um, people were very positive about it. And we're looking forward to seeing the cross sections used in designing roads in new neighborhoods as the, when the implementation uh, wrinkles are worked out, as well as being used as a reference point um, in road renewal projects throughout the city. And I think it's telling that in the Westmount uh, Complete Streets pilot of neighborhood renewal that the community doesn't even know that it's Complete Streets or what Complete Streets was about. It was a surprise to me to hear that uh, in the uh, earlier item today. Uh, and also, um, we were quite concerned last month, as you know, when the arterial road renewal capital budget proposal came uh, before council and excluded Complete Streets uh, and considered a, a, a possible enhancement to be considered even when council policy with regard to complete streets is to utilize, and I quote, utilize the principles of complete streets in all new and rehabilitation projects that take place on public road right of way, uh, unquote. Uh, we want to thank you again for requesting a revised proposal to incorporate uh, complete streets and other improvements. And we're concerned that um, going forward, um, complete streets may be viewed as an add-on rather than an, an, an integral part of road design. And then a final point that we would have that during the cross-sections work on, um, uh, uh, on the Complete Streets cross-sections, some items that came, came up that were put in a parking lot uh, for further consideration by transportation, and one of them was, as uh, was mentioned earlier today, that um, bike lanes be used for snow storage and we just want to repeat that uh, that really uh, sort of defeats the purpose. Uh, and so thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. And I hope I haven't been too repetitive as I've been here three times. No, that's okay. Um, Councilor Walters had to step out for a second, so he asked me to take the chair. I'm not sure if that's legit or not. I'm the ranking so-and-so, so. Um, so uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Falk, uh, you've got uh, five minutes. You know the drill. I have another PowerPoint. I don't know if they're going to put it up for everyone to see or not. But, uh, are you putting it up for everyone or yeah. no? Okay. okay, thank you. Go ahead. So uh, I want to comment on the Complete Streets implementation update. Again, I'm a compu commuter, motorist, pedestrian, and cyclist. I'm here to com comment on the Complete Streets implement implementation update to make recommendations for modifications based on real-world user experience as and also ask why the largest user group is virtually ignored in this document. And when I say that, I'm referring to Section 4, Complete Streets Elements Toolkits. It refers to everyone except for cars. Statistics Canada shows that 1.3% per can of Canadians travel by bicycle to get to work, approximately 80% use vehicles to get to work in Edmonton, and approximately 18 to 20 percent use transit. The Complete Street Guidelines and City of Edmonton should reflect these user numbers in planning and developing infrastructure. My request to the committee, to bring proportionality to this document, the city policy, based on user numbers. For example, on 140th Street, 100 pedestrians, an uncounted number of cyclists were able to get 50 percent of the available road space in option one, and they represent 0.71 of 1% of the road users. Add to the policy document that the proportion of road use, re, road use real estate is in proportion to the number of users. And I think this is a very important thing that needs to be added to policy number C573. I would ask that you suspend the complete, complete streets guide until 
one, the impact of communities and times added to be added to the criteria so that shortened commute times are better for all users. Sharing of road real estate should be in proportion to the number of users, including motor vehicles. Gridlock, bottlenecks, congestion are viewed as problems to be solved. Impact of winter conditions and snow be added to the complete streets guidelines and how to deal with unused bicycle lanes in winter. Address vehicle traffic and the, and the impact on users. Also that the threshold where the complete street guidelines apply be dropped from 20,000 users per day to 2,000 users per day. And this is still generous given the, uh, the, 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 the numbers. Also that the modal priorities which are, be identified in the complete streets guide, which they are currently not, that the complete street guidelines apply to real current users and not phantom users. On page 59 it says the goal is to design bicycle facilities to target the user group interested but not concerned. I don't even know what that means. To put bicycle and at, at intersections, put bicycle behind cars rather than in front of cars so the cars don't have to, bicycle, have to pass the bicycles until the next traffic light. Car users be added as a section in the document. Currently trucks, transit, pedestrians and cyclists are addressed but not the largest user group, cars and motor vehicles. Issues and comments. What are the modal priorities? It's not contained in the complete street size. It's obvious vehicles at the bottom of the priority list. I think this is unacceptable. Taking lanes away from cars causes drivers to seek alternate routes through communities because the arterial road is not functioning as it should as an arterial roadway. This is an untested social experiment that is negatively impacting commuters. It adds time whether by car, bus, train or cycle. Seasonality is not considered in the document. Bicycle real estate is unused except for a few hardcore users for six months of the year. The road real estate is not being put to use at a time when commute times are increasing in the winter. I suggest the following modifications to the policy C573. All users be accommodated in the proportion to which they are using the road. Complete streets apply to new neighborhoods but not to rehabilitation projects. That car idling being considered as a negative environmental consequence of the increased congestion con created by complete streets. That the guidelines are rewritten so as not to cause bottlenecks and congestion as they currently do. There is no reduction in the real estate for the main user group of a road, mostly ve mainly vehicles, and the effect of commute times must apply as a standard as part of the complete streets policy. So here's my re final recommendations. Complete streets guidelines be suspended. Commute times be added as a priority. The documents state what my motor priorities are. Reduce the threshold uh, from 20,000 to 2,000 cars to keep the arterial roadways what they're called, arteries, or arterial roadways. Alternatively, low volume, safer, use, safer roads be used for bicycle commuters through neighborhoods. There's no noise coming from bicycles. The streets are quieter. There's less traffic. It's safer for everybody. Number six, that the complete streets guide be not be applied to the 142 street project and be suspended until it can be modified so that 98% of the users get 98% of the real estate and the road allowance not currently used be for pedestrians and cyclists. The road real estate is be used in proportion to the number of users and that movable barriers be used so that the road can be reconfigured to reflect changing user patterns as they emerge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Falk. Questions from committee? Councillor Anderson. Mr. Moore, you used um, some numbers that would generate the new pieces of paper that would have to be both submitted and reviewed. Can you look at the beginning of your material and give me those numbers again? I suggested that there would be approximately, could be as many as 300 subdivision applications. Uh, we had, we've had more than that this year. Uh, so I'm using an average, I think it was 270 something uh, the year, a year ago, 300 and something this year. So the, the average around 300, which is typical. And, and, each, and each might have how many different cross sections? Well, the, the complete streets guideline requires that each cross section be justified. So if you have a collector road, an arterial road, or perhaps multiple uh, local roadways, they will all be, have to be assessed against the principles of complete streets. So a typical subdivision, I just picked a number of four or five. So five times 300 is 1,500. And, and they have to be reviewed then, not just by transportation, but by all of the affected departments, which means all of the, the agencies of the city including just, EPCOR. Thank you very much. And just, you're suggesting to pilot this in Greenfield development for either this or a particular construction season. 
Well, I mean, it's not for the construction season. The, the, the submission of the greenfield cross sections are now going to be in support of subdivision applications. So the issue of, of what sections are going to be used have to be resolved before the engineering drawings are completed and well in advance of, sub of the, the construction season. In fact, this process would begin, I suggest, almost immediately because there will be a subdivision applications coming forward for the so rest of this year. So if it was phased and 20% either what, dr by draw or random or some... Well, some I think the industry could work something out sure. with the city on what the appropriate ones would be, but, but I'm suggesting a maximum, just recognizing the, the strains on the approval process today, you're, it wouldn't be you're prudent. You're saying to test, test drive the process. Yeah. And, and we, we will have to develop some criteria and protocols as we go through this. Working with a smaller group will allow us to streamline some of that, and then when we implement it fully, it will be a, an easier process. So give me the time that you think the review of the 20% slice would come back for, for review at, at Transportation Committee. I would see the 20, the, that 20% that maximum of 20% would happen over the next 12 months. In other words, all of the subdivisions that will be submitted in 2014, 2015 would go through that, not all of them, 20% of them would go through that process. So a year from now or 18 months from now, we would expect yeah. to, to well, be able to analyze the pilot? Well, I suggested possibly even coming back six months from now and then follow up with a, another report six months after that. At least you'll understand the progress and if there are real issues and how quickly we can move forward. And the arbitration process is to simply work through differences of opinion between a submitter and a reviewer. Someone needs to play Solomon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. A uh, couple questions uh, again to you, Mr. Moore. So the have you raised this question in the past about past about how long it's going or the impact it's going to have on uh, subdivision applications? Yes, through the review process, uh, through the the, through the uh, engagement process. consultation process, and and so on. We did raise that issue as one of the items we wanted to address. Uh, we maybe probably we didn't explain our concern as well, but we are very concerned about the impact, and that's why we're here today to reinforce it. Okay. Uh, have you talked to the administration about the since the reports come out since you've received the report? Uh, just briefly, yes. Okay. <laughs> In the milling about. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so when you say the number fifteen hundred assessments, that's three hundred subdivision applications per. But there, if I, if what's we the time frame in which you would submit three hundred subdivision app? One year. One year. Three hundred subdivision. That, that's what that approximately what we have looked at in the past year, so it's reasonable to expect given the market conditions sure. it's going to be the same going forward. Okay, so that would be 1,500 assessments potentially, give or take, annually, which would involve transportation, sustainable development, drainage, community services, the, EPCOR. the range, EPCOR, exactly. right. Uh, and, what, and I'm just trying to understand exactly what you're asking. So that the first, for, so for the next year we would only require you to do 20% of those. So we would choose, or you would choose, or suggest to us 20% of them that you would do mm -hmm. the complete streets assessment on. Yes. And you, and you think that's achievable, that's not in your, and then I, that, I'm that. Saying, I'm saying a maximum of 20% excellent. because, and, and I defer to the various departments to indicate what the impact would be on their plan approval process, but it is stretched significantly right now. Adding anything to that would be problematic and, and potentially very disruptive to the And industry. you think that 20% or less will inform us in 6, 12, 18 months how much time is these assessments add to a development approval process? Just referring back to some of the comments made in, in previously in the presentation, this is a new process. Right. People have not gone through this before, so asking them to provide assessments at that scale immediately is it's going to be problematic. They have to go through, a, the, the city staff will have to go through a learning curve themselves, as will we in the industry. It's just prudent to, to narrow that. You went through the, the pilot project process for the, um, the rehabilitation projects. Okay, yeah. We've not gone through a pilot project per se for the greenfield. I'm not suggesting we do one or two or three. 20% sure. of 300 is about 60. So if we did 40 or 50 subdivisions, that's a significant effort. 
Okay, so we'll raise that question uh, with administration as well. You had also alluded to 5.2 of the complete streets policy. Yeah, complete streets. Or the guidelines. Because I couldn't find that. Anyway, so the, but what it suggests is that we wouldn't advance this fully until both our administration and the development industry as it relates to Greenfield we're comfortable moving forward. Right. That and that was determined by council actually, I think um, more than a year ago, and, and we've moved forward in that process. Okay. Certainly in, in creating the guidelines as they stand is an advancement on that, but now we have to go through the implementation. Okay. Uh, I think that is all I had. And we'll ask admin uh, similar questions. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, appreciate uh, the time, especially those of you who gave three presentations today. It's solid citizenship. Thank you. This is questions related to both 6.2 and 6.3 now. Okay, Councillor Anderson. Um, first of all, could you either put that up on the screen or pull it up in front of you as a hard copy? I'm not sure if I've got that one on that on the screen. Well, it's in the report. It's yeah, it's in the report. I. Is the only change on the top and the bottom the material here the addition of a shared use path in a median? Sorry, I'm going to just introduce uh, Ainsley Brown is here. She's been working on complete streets implementation. And Natalie is, Lizerko is going to, she's been working on 142nd Street. So we'll have whoever's sure. most appropriate I'd to answer the question. Um, Oops. The drawing in, that you had in front of you, uh, the very top drawing is the existing, and That's so the correct. difference between the top and the bottom um, is the addition of a, a sidewalk or sidewalk connectors, pardon me, on the west side of the road. So you'll see that on the very bottom drawing on the west side. Um, they're not shown very well um, on the cross-section view, but right. they would be connections from bus stops to the intersections. And then on the east side of the road would be the addition of a shared use path within the, the boulevard space on the east side of the road. So that's the primary difference I, between I, the two. I'm assuming that this set of vehicles is going this way and this vehicle is going that way, correct? Um, the thing that you're seeing on the very, very um, right side of the drawing, yeah. that would be, um, that's meant to be the, the Dover Court community or the, um, the alley that um, runs along the west side of Dover Court. So it's a... An, okay, so we've yeah. got two lanes. Yeah, you've got four... in each direction. That's existing right. Existing now and the only change is the addition of a shared use path. Uh, Plus transit connectors on the west side and then at the 118th Avenue intersection. That, the transit connectors don't adjust traffic. Right. And then the, the 118th Avenue intersection is where the, the biggest impact to traffic would be where we would have to remove one lane to accommodate that shared use path. But not in the concept two. Uh, it would be common to concept concept two as well. We would have to remove a lane through 118th Avenue to accommodate that shared use path. Well, I'm, I'm horribly confused because the top line shows me two lanes in each direction and the bottom line shows me two lanes in each direction. Correct. That cross section is taken further north. It's not showing you the 118th Avenue intersection. Okay. That's what the drawing um, that Rhonda has up on the, the display is showing you is the change at the intersection specifically. Well, I, I sure hope the councillor for the area can guide us through this. Um, would you please respond to um, comments by UDI? They are making a suggestion that this be phased, that 20% of the cross-sections for new subdivision applications be uh, required in the first go-round and that they be reviewed 
before implementing any additional cross-section submission requirements with the subdivision. So just to be clear, we're moving from 142nd Street to the uh, implementation, and what we want to do with UDI is develop, and we'll call it, it still be a pilot program, so how do we bring this on stream, and uh, Peter's idea of taking proportion, a large enough proportion so we can see how it works, I mean, that's the idea, and then we need to evaluate it, and if there's a problem partway through, we don't wait six months. I mean, we're we're going to be, you know, getting on it right away. The idea isn't to bog down anyone, but rather see how can we implement this in an effective way. We're looking at simple templates, and can we make it work? So you're saying that there's going to be communication with UDI, and you're going to settle on a way to implement Absolutely. this that works for both. Mr. Ohm, uh, sorry to pick on you. Um, Generally speaking, councillors and, and, and other stakeholders have made comments about delays in permitting and, and moving applications through the system. As described, if we're talking about 300, or pardon me, uh, uh, the possibility of 1,500 new pieces of paper that require review by f three, four, or five different jurisdictions, uh, I can't help but assume that that is not going to help speed up the process. Uh, any comments? Yeah, the, the comment by Mr. Moore, is, I, I would agree with. Uh, we're challenged by volume currently. Um, we're, we're, we're working in a significant way with certain departments to be able to unlock um, the review drawing process. So I would concur that we, we certainly have our challenges right now. Just, just to comment as far as, as complete streets are concerned, I would hope that we are adjusting streets to neighborhoods and not neighborhoods to streets. Thank That's just a comment. Thank you. Councillor Esslinger, you can comment on that. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to kind of go back to the 142nd Street discussion. My understanding, as I've driven through there, there's no sidewalks currently along 142nd, and, and that's one of the changes that's coming. That's correct. And when you did the consultation with the community, you talked about, a, I believe, a working group and then the public consultation. Is, is that my understanding correct? Yes, that's right. Um, we had a stakeholder input group um, with which we held um, two workshops. Prior to those workshops, we had an online survey to gather feedback from residents as well as other users of the 142 Street Corridor, and we had well over 100 responses to that survey. Um, one of the common things that we did hear was that um, there are no pedestrian facilities along the route, and that's something that they desired. And uh, I certainly appreciated the recommendation coming out to option two because when I attended the open house, it was quite clear that people wanted to have the shared use path, minimum traffic disruption. And if, my, if I understand all the drawings clearly, it's really just around the 118th where there's a change in traffic flow. That's correct. Now, one of the speakers talked about that change in traffic flow, and did you consider that when you proposed this plan, or how do you feel it impact traffic? Most definitely, that was something that we looked at quite closely. Um, it will have impacts during the peak of the peak hour, um, so there will be um, added queuing during the peak hour because of the reduced number of lanes. However, for most of the day, um, the roadway is well built and can su sufficiently accommodate the traffic that we um, have currently and that we expect into the future. Um, it's in general for most of the day the road is overbuilt. Okay, I, I really appreciate you going to the suggest and the option to because of the stakeholder input because that shows us that it can change our plans and it's very valuable. Now I want to swap right over to complete streets. Now um, I'm familiar with Grease Baugh and some of the proposals under complete streets. But I'm also aware there's some problems in trying to preserve those trees and in that process. Can you comment on that? So in Griesbaugh, you're right, there, uh, um, there have been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of collaboration in a lot of the areas of Griesbaugh. We have come to, to solutions and to a design that um, does preserve the, the existing trees and meets their vision. In a couple of remaining blocks, we have 
um, an applicant who has a very distinct vision and we are running into some some constraints in terms of the city standards uh, particularly in in providing for fire access that uh, that those two those two needs are conflicting um, in the end we have uh, administration has provided options back to the applicant to uh, to meet fire rescues requirements okay now I did hear from the gentleman from UDI suggesting an arbitration process would that have helped in this kind of situation where they they have a different vision than what our standards want to allow it could I suppose if if the the arbitrator was willing to overrule fires requirements um, as it is now typically we look at um, the SDAB as an arbitrator okay uh, I, I mean I think we want to encourage that innovation and flexibility and uh, I was very interested in this arbitration because I think it gives us another option as we move forward um, when I look at the complete streets and the concept, I mean, I think it's wonderful for us to look at it, communities holistically and engage all the partners. So uh, I'll be listening to what my colleagues say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I just have a couple questions related to 6.2, just so I'm, I'm almost clear. The only difference is at the intersection Fill in the blank. The, the biggest difference with the 118th Avenue intersection, if you look at the drawing on the, the left side of the screen, yes. you'll see that in the southbound direction, we have a through right on the far, far left. <laughs> sorry if that's confusing. Yes. Um, so Just to confirm that it is. <laughs> yes, <but>. sorry. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Ainsley's got the mouse. So we're okay. Good. Where Ainsley's got the mouse, we've got a southbound through right lane. Right. Um, the middle lane there that she's got the mouse on now is a southbound through lane, followed by a southbound left turn bay. Oh, I got you. Okay. And I got the it. biggest difference is in the proposed um, vision, it would be a southbound through right and then a lane okay. drop at the Thank intersection. Thank you. Maybe more of an eyesight issue than an intellectual issue. Uh, Sorry, hopefully. Uh, the. the uh, now the community, what, in your understanding or assessment, why did the community prefer this? It's a bit of a split. Um, this was something that came as a bit of a surprise to us when we got the feedback on, on the two options. The, the feedback was, was very split between concept one and concept two. Um, this, this option provides um, what we feel is the best balance from a technical policy and um, stakeholder input perspective. From uh, the public's um, or this, the stakeholder's point of view, it depends on what type of a user you are. If you are com a commuter, this does have traffic implications. However, if you are a resident of the Dover Court community and would like to um, walk or cycle along this route, this um, does provide um, that as an option. Um, it provides you with um, this is a traffic calming. Does it have a traffic calming impact? It, it, effect, there, it may. Um, I, I'm not. I'm it's, not sure. It, that's not the the full intent of it. Right. It may have some. That was one of the things that some stakeholders did did point out as as to um, their support for concept um, one, which was the one where so, one southbound lane was removed for a longer stretch, and they felt that it would have the um, potential to. Tra um, calm traffic, slow traffic down, and perhaps reduce some of the noise in the area. Okay, thank you. And and just in terms of 6.3, I just want to confirm. So you're, are you suggesting that what is in the recommendation, um, in the report, that there is the opportunity to phase in and to work with the development, with the UDI and, and the development industry on phasing in the greenfield? assessments? Councillor Walters, I think it's an absolute must that we phase this in because we've got to figure it out as we go and we need to assess. Um, the idea of uh, these several pilots is to try and figure out how do we apply this in different situations and wh what is working and then how do we apply those learnings to the next situation. So for, for certain we need to um, step through that as we go forward. Okay, well I think we'll 
Okay. Well, we'll look at this motion just to provide some clarity and comfort and, and discuss that. We can put it up in a second, but Councillor Katarina was... Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on this one here, the complete streets, um, can you clarify for me why uh, 112th Avenue is considered an arterial renewal pilot? How, how did this ever become a pilot? What, what's the reference to? Why is it in here? So, so I know you're aware of the long history of 112th Avenue and how we were asked by Council in light of the upcoming reconstruction to look at the potential for a three-lane cross-section there. Right. So we went through that public process and we consider that as part of a complete streets process because we were basically engaging the community to find out what it was that they desired from that road. We engaged the commuters that were using the road to find it out what they desired from the road and then we engage with our internal stakeholders to try to find some compromise that would fulfill the desires of all of those groups. We ended up with a four-lane cross-section so it is a reconstruction project it is remaining at the four lanes but in order to prove walkability and meet some of the community's desires we are making some improvements with boulevards, sidewalks and landscaping. Okay so uh, it really not the same as 142nd on what you're proposing there. I, I think it's more the process that would be similar. Okay. It's not the actual outcome of the process. I think each road that we go through this process is going to come out with a unique outcome. So we followed a complete streets process for 112th Avenue. Okay. Was that ever mentioned in your consultations? And I was at every meeting that this was a complete streets pilot that you were using the same criteria because I never heard it the, the not once streets guidelines hadn't been approved yet when we started right. so, so it, it, didn't it even wasn't presented as such but it didn't exist yet for us it was testing out the process okay well it would have been interesting to uh, have at least been informed that that was your thinking uh, when you were attending these community meetings and uh, and consulting because I think that would have uh, uh, alleviated a lot of angst from both sides. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Just on that, my, my memory is that when we made the decision on 1 at 12th and there was a, and said four lane, we also told, them to, told you to go back and work with the community and work on the design to make sure we could do what we could to improve the pedestrian realm. That was a motion of council, was it not? Yes, it was. Okay, so I'm just to put that in context. So when you say complete streets, it really, and I, and I want to ask some questions because I'm hearing complete streets bandied around in a whole bunch of ways that I think assume that complete streets is one answer. It's not a template to say this is the way we do a street, correct? Correct, and I think that whole idea of the concept of 112th Avenue, well, it wasn't identified as complete streets. It, it just represents, you know, we're calling, we, we're giving it a title, but it's not that we haven't been doing it, but we're trying to be proactive and um, institutionalize that we're always thinking all modes and how can we come up with a good process, and that's what this process of complete streets is what about. What complete streets was, was a way to have a look at each situation in its context, understand how it went with the way people use the street, who's going on the street, what the users are, and to make sure that if we have the opportunity to redesign the street, we look at all the current users and understand those contexts, and also understand it in terms of the, of the built form that's around it. That's what Complete Streets is, correct? Exactly. It forces us to ask a set of questions that go beyond, strictly speaking, how do we move cars along the road. Right. Which is largely what we were doing before. Correct. So on, to use the 142nd Street as an example, I'm, I just to explore with you on this, the fact that there was a go track down one side of the street suggested that there were people using that, that road that were not being served by the current... Correct. So what you've done is you've responded to the current use and you've said, as we redesign the street, we have to make sure that we take care of the current users. And, and what we're bringing them, for you them, instead of is a goat track, giving them a sidewalk or multi-use trail. Giving them a right? sidewalk or multi-use trail, but recognizing that there are trade-offs. And so why we're bringing this forward is to talk to you about those trade-offs and are you comfortable, Council, recognizing this? there's a trade-off needed? And the one trade-off on the other side of the street, which is the thing that we have traded off, because I'm not hearing anybody say, 
that putting a multi-use trail in where the goat track is is a bad idea. It sounds like everybody's on board for that. But the trade, just so we understand the trade-off on the other side of that street, is we currently have bus stops, which I'm guessing we have no pedestrian connection to. Yes, that's right. There, there are a couple of locations where there's connections with sidewalks, but there's, for most of them, it's a floating bus stop with no connection right. at so, all. We, and there's, I would argue this, either we have the bus stop and allow people to walk to it or we get rid of the bus stop. So, so that, but there is a trade-off there in terms of whether, so you're at minimum now going to have a pedestrian connection to each of those bus stops. The trade-off is it may not be a continuous connection along the whole side. And that was the trade-off about the extra lane, right? So that's, that's correct. Yeah. So if you take away the lane the whole way along, then you can provide a sidewalk all the way along. And so in going in and using a complete street template, in this case, you're looking at that context and you're trying to respond to the context. And that allowed you guys to ask a different set of questions from the questions you were asking before when we were going in and doing road design. That's all complete street says, correct? Looking at context and trying to respond to use and trying to balance the different needs. The idea of looking at all the use and, and in, in the context is what we're trying to do. Cause I, cause, and, but it, what it isn't is, except in the case of Greenfield, where there was a request to come up with a number of different templates so that you didn't have to do this level of work on every single road to understand that, that we could be a bit more generic in a Greenfield case because we were dealing with a new neighborhood rather than an existing condition, right? Right, so the principle's still the same, but we're trying to facilitate an easy way of doing it. And the idea of Greenfield cross-sections is how can we make this approval better? That's all, all we're trying to do with this. And so we're still trying to work through that process, and but that's the idea of this partial. In that case, you're, Canadian, you're creating the context because it's a new neighborhood at the same time as you're trying to respond to a transportation that allows all modes as you create the context. Right? right, but looking so at the context, simpler. you still yeah. want to match up yeah. the road with that context. Okay, thanks. Those are my questions. Okay, Councillor Nack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Last question I think I have on um, 6.2. After you cross southbound at 118th Ave and it goes down to one lane, does it stay one lane all the way to 111th Ave or at what point does it go back? Does it, because I know at 111th it'll go back to two lanes, I imagine. Just past that intersection, just south oh. of the intersection, it returns to two lanes. So we're not even talking like a block? No, it's just through the intersection oh, okay. that there, that lane drop would happen. So we're, okay, so that's even less of an impact than I expected. Uh, great, that that's answers that question. And we do expect that once uh, Yellowhead becomes a right only coming from, uh, I guess that'd be going eastbound, that's going to cut the traffic down pretty substantially on 142nd, would it not? It certainly would have a, a reduction effect. Yeah. Um, it, it may remain very similar to what it is today for the northern stretch between Yellowhead Trail and North, 124th. Of course, but yeah, coming coming southbound, and that's part of why the recommendation. I mean, if you're talking just taking less than a block, yeah, okay, that that answers that question. Going to the complete street side, and, and just maybe, and I think you know, I was talking with Councillor Henderson. It might be nice for, especially me as a new councillor, I'd love to almost have like an info session on it. So I've read through the policy, but it might be good to have that. Um, is it, that's not a don't you think? That's a don't you think question. Um, but maybe you could provide a little context because I remember going or listening to some of the debates. That's one of the few times I don't recall anyone when that policy went before council. Did anyone speak against complete streets? There were concerns here and there, but I mean, ESCL had been consulted for a very long time representing community leagues across the city of Edmonton. UDI was there, of course, bringing up everyone had thoughts and comments, but I think overall it was almost unanimously supported, was it not? It was unanimously supported by council. Unanimously supported by council, and I, and I recall through listening to the debate, it was the public business, everyone was, was pretty supportive of the idea and the concept of it, because it's not just about cars, it's about everyone, as, as Councillor Henderson sort of did. It's, it's everything. So I just want to get a bit of history and maybe see if you could do an info session for at least some of the new ones. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Mack. Councillor McKean has Thank you. Question. Finally, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> to me, Quickly, and this please. is tangential uh, with the committee's indulgence, I have an inquiry uh, going to council in coming days about plain language. And uh, when you talk about an info session for councillors on complete streets, um, I think we would probably should do one for the entire community. And the problem here is inside baseball language. And I've run into it already, and it's not your fault, 
I'm not angry with you. I wish all the general managers and the city manager were sitting in here. We do this all the time to people. We put a headline on something and we think everybody knows what we're talking about. And in point of fact, some of us don't know what we're talking about. And I wonder if that was unanimously supported because not everybody knew exactly what it was. So there's a cautionary tale here. It's a teachable moment. I think we all have to think hard about how, because the way we talk in here is the way we go out and talk in the community. And, and I just think, Having run into this in Westmont, they had they were freaked out because they didn't even know what complete streets were. So that's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My pleasure, Councillor Anderson. Miss, Mr. Falk brought up or made a comment about the resurfacing of the road, making sure that it occurred after any kind of utility work was done. Uh, is that germane to this discussion? I think that's a really important point and that's something that we certainly want to avoid. We don't want to tear up a brand new road. Um, in the case do, of... Do we have utility work scheduled it, or it, in the queue? In the next several years, there will be um, drainage work for the 142 Street area. However, um, I've been um, assured by the drainage department that that work is generally going to be trenchless and so will not impact the surface of the new road. So we're talking... It, it's off-site um, storage, so a new dry pond. Okay. Um, can you tell me in plain language um, why there is an impact on the actual operation of the road in concept two what causes that so in both concept one and concept two with the removal of the one southbound lane you're losing that extra capacity at the intersection so you end up with um, vehicles queuing in one lane rather than two as they are today so the queues would get longer um, which means the, the cycle lengths or the, the uh, signal phasing pardon me the uh, amount of green time that each phase is getting would have to be changed so, so I'll back up then I I tried to suggest to you that this and this was identical and you says, oh, that was somewhere else. Uh, yes, the, that's right. So that cross section is taken further north of the intersection. So the, the drawing again that's up on the screen is showing specifically 118th Avenue. So the cross sections there are not at 118th Avenue. Is it possible for a, a multi-use trail to be added to the road right of way on 142nd without interfering with the roadway at all? Not unless you take it around the east side of the EPCOR site on the alley, at which point then you've got a shared use path that's being shared with an alley. For the whole... Oh, for the whole stretch south of no, here? No, for, for, but that would be for a very short distance, would it not? Yes, that's right. So you would, you would be adjacent to the road and then you would take a right around a building and continue up against the road um, you could you could do that the the other issue is if you look at the um, southeast corner of this intersection so the bottom right um, we get into some land constraints so you might know that um, when 42 Street south of 118th Avenue was rehabbed in 2010 um, a shared use path was planned as part of that work. However, we ran into some constraints in terms of acquiring land or an easement for that property at the southeast corner. Um, the property owner wasn't amenable to that. Um, so this, uh, by proposing the removal of one lane through this intersection, we then free up enough space to be able to um, give ourselves room to build the shared use path to the south. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we have any, no other further questions that I can see. So why don't we proceed with the recommendation in 6.2 to begin with. Uh, so, Councillor, if you want to move that. I'll move the recommendation in 6.2. Okay. Uh, so any, wanna, you want to speak to it? Or shall we just vote? Okay. So I will call the question. 
on the recommendation in 6.2 that is outlined in attachment to uh, this June 5th report. So all those in favor of this recommendation, please vote. Okay, that motion is carried. So the, as per the recommendation in 6.3, we can, so Madam Clerk, if you can help me understand, we can move this, receive this for information, and then there's the, and then pass the subsequent, or debate the subsequent, which would just provide some clarity. Administration provide a report with recommendations based on discussions with City's Development Industry to Transportation Committee on the, A, an appropriate number of subdivisions to participate in the pilot for the Complete Streets Greenfield Cross Sections Project and a potential arbitration process to be followed during the pilot. I'll move, uh, I'll move we receive 6.3 for information. Okay, so we can uh, do that first. So all those in favor of, of accepting 6.3 for information. Okay, that's carried. Uh, now comments, uh, Ms. Tui on... I, I'm suggesting rather than appropriate number, we simply um, define a process. You know, we need to figure out what, what's the process we're going to work through so that we can roll this out as opposed to giving a specific number and then we need to adjust it if, as, as we go along. So I think if we can come together with UDI with how we roll this out, I think that would um, serve your purpose. So you're suggesting uh, to Transportation Committee on a process yeah. to participate in the pilot for the complete stream screen fall. Yeah. A pilot process? Pilot yeah, a process. process I think pilot? Councillor Henderson is Whatever. right that it's a process for the pilot, uh, assuming participation it doesn't need to be stated. Uh, they will likely Lots of interest in participating, undoubtedly. Okay. So, uh, any comments on this? Uh, just quick, uh, committee members? Fine, okay. Come back. So, just to check, I guess the question I have is, you are, aren't you already doing that? If we approve that, other than the only difference is you get the report. Is that is that the, the added piece? You just want to have that report mechanism because you're whether, doing that. Whether you asked for a report or not, we would still do this. Okay. We would still be developing a process and trying to figure it out and, and rolling it out. But and then you th would, this just requires that it comes to, to transportation And you just committee. say, here's what we did. Right. Okay. That's just me. Okay. No. No. Councillor Anderson. You ready? <laughs> the concern from Mr. Moore, the acknowledgement from Mr. Ohm, is that we are already backlogged because of volume. This is conceivably a significant additional amount of volume, and we need to go at this slowly with our eyes wide open and make sure that whatever we engage in here works and doesn't keep throwing, you know, sand in the icing. Councillor Anderson, I'd be the last one that wants to bog down our process because it means, you know, additional work. So we want to make something that's, that's so workable for I, us I, and simple. And I totally accept that comment. You always do. The comment here is that the report would come back on what the process is. Mr. Moore suggested that the report come back reviewing what had happened and moving into a phase two or a phase three after we've made sure that phase one works. I don't want to hear, a, a, a re, I don't want to report on what kind of a process you're going to use with UDI. You negotiate, they agree, you agree, go ahead and do it, put it into effect for X number of months or a year, and then bring it back and say, all right, we found that this worked, this didn't, we're going to change this, and as we move into phase two or more implementation, we're going to understand what the, the negative effects were, we're going to eliminate them and move this forward as, as positively as possible. So the report that I'm expecting has nothing to do with what the process is. I don't care. 
And so what you're suggesting is something similar that happened, say, a year ago, where, you know, there was the just a flag from UDI, well, we're concerned about this, and we said, okay, you know, we're going to come back, and this is what we're doing right now, and tell you what we've done. And so what you're suggesting is that, you know, we do the same thing. We come back and tell you what, you've, what we've done over the past whatever it is, and six months, worked, year. How it, how it worked and what their concern was, what right. your concern was, what it did to planning and the approval process. So what... Can I clarify? So what we've heard is is the need for a pilot, and so a phased-in phased approach, which we could call a pilot, but we can call it a phased-in approach. Um, plain language. language. Phased-in approach. More words is often plainer. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. If I could just also provide uh, provide committee the assurance that that the UDI representatives meet uh, with the senior city staff at the general manager level monthly. Uh, our next meeting is June 26th, um, and that is a can be a very responsive uh, working group to dealing with issues about volume, backlog. Uh, the city's committed to meeting a 100-day turnaround time, and, and we both have both sides in the industry and the city have, have work to do on that, and so we're very cognizant of, of uh, a time to process this through. So what I'd suggest is that uh, June 26th, uh, between the UDI and the senior city staff, we start talking about how we, how we implement this and make sure this goes smoothly and that the, the report back in, in six months be the uh, subject of that conversation. So if you're suggesting that everything that they're asking for is implicit in, this, in the receipt of this for information, and then this is not necessary. What we're debating on that screen is completely superfluous. I don't think it's necessary. Okay. I think that's well, part of what we would be doing would be to try and work out a process. We're going to have to negotiate and try and make it work and figure it out, and it's going to be adjusted on the fly for sure as, as we go. But we can report back to you if you would like to hear in ever, whatever it is, six months, a year's time, this is what we've been doing on complete streets and we could make it a report not just on the green field but these right. are the things that have been happening. And do you need direction from us right now to do that or will you? Okay, good. Well, thank you for all your work and your time here today. We'll move on to 6.4. Don, okay. Don Grimble. So the, is there a presentation uh, from admin on 6.4? Do we go to speaker? No. No? No presentation? So, um, forgive me, Mr. Grimble, if you could come up, please. Thank you for your patience. You've been here all day. Billable hours. I hope at least it is. Thank you. Okay. Your time. You're ready. Do you have a presentation or are you just... I'm, I'm ready, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you very much. Please proceed and thank you again. Um, my name is Don Grimble. I'm the Managing Director of the Trans-Canada Yellowhead Highway Association. Um, maybe some of you have not heard of it, so I'll give you a, a quick teachable moment here and a history. The uh, association consists of 100 municipalities stretching from Winnipeg to Masset on Haida Kauai. Uh, we have been in existence for 67 years. Uh, one of the prime movers for the organization was uh, Mayor um, Harry Ainley, uh, who was uh, a spearhead for this organization. A number of other mayors have taken that role as well. Uh, our, our task as an association is to continue to promote the use and development of the Trans-Canada Highway simply because it's a very important economic development tool for all four provinces and the northern communities in all those provinces. So Saskatoon, Edmonton, Yorkton, uh, Prince Rupert, uh, Prince George. Um, so all of them, you know, certainly we benefit by collective action. Uh, my purpose here today is to update you on um, a specific initiative that, that we have entered into. Um, which we're working in with the city of Edmonton on, and that's to work with the federal government to get the, trans, the Yellowhead Trans Canada Highway identified as a significant natural, uh, a significant infrastructure, national infrastructure for, uh, for the country, and that ties into the new Building Canada Action Plan, which basically has set up some funding mechanisms. Um, and one of those pockets of funding is for programs of a national significance. 
And we think this is an opportunity for the association because we represent um, basically all of Western Canada, uh, at least the northern half of it anyway. Um, so that really, to me, speaks to the idea of something which is national in scope. <clears throat> uh, at our meeting on uh, annual meeting, which was in May, uh, we passed a resolution uh, to direct the association to go forth with and, and develop uh, basically this national highway policy. Um, and then to advocate on behalf of our members who had significant projects that might qualify for that. Uh, significantly, the Edmonton has the Yellowhead Trail, and the Yellowhead Trail is a part of the, of the uh, uh, Yellowhead. Yeah, it is certainly part of the Trans-Canada, designated as such. So it would, in our view, would qualify, and it is also the busiest portion of the highway, and uh, all the travelers on the highway could be basically benefit from the from significant improvements on there. Uh, and as well, we've been participating as an association with the administration and looking at, at how those uh, plans could be affected. So we have other, certainly other municipalities that have equal cause. Um, the city of Saskatoon, for example, with a connector which goes uh, from east side of the city to the north side of the city. Um, <clears throat> we have issues with respect to the national park, uh, Jasper National Park. And, and we're looking at how we can basically improve traffic flows through there. And we, in British Columbia, you know, there are some needs for passing lanes on some portions of both Highway 5 and the Trans-Canada Highway, which volume is increasing, but they don't quite uh, justify a full twinning. So those are projects which all would also be on the board. Uh, but at the moment, nice thing about uh, the Yellowhead Trail in Edmonton, it's... it's uh, close to conceptual plans have been done, so we have an idea what needs to be done. Some of these other projects haven't gone that far yet. So I'm, I'm uh, happy to give you a teachable moment about the Yellowhead. Uh, it's significant for Edmonton, and I'll take any questions. I'd just like to acknowledge Councilor Eisinger, or Eisinger who's uh, are on our board of directors, and uh, happy to have her. Thank you, sir. Questions, Councilor Eisinger? Um. I'm very familiar with the resolution and uh, very happy that it passed unanimously at uh, the AGM. Um, what has happened since then for, on our behalf in your avocation strategy? One of the things that we, um, we've been working on this for a little bit. Uh, one of the things we did, we met with the Manitoba PC caucus. Um, it was a, f a good frank discussion and basically they sort of told us the rules of the road, uh, what we needed to do uh, to make, bring this to the attention of the federal government. Uh, so our intent is to uh, build our case. Uh, we will also be uh, um, touching through our, we're using our members to do this. In this case of Manitoba, our vice president from Manitoba was the one that facilitated this meeting. We will do likewise across the other three provinces with federal representatives. And uh, <clears throat> the idea will be to build our case a bit at a time and uh, hopefully get their support uh, from all the MPs across the prov uh, four provinces. And specifically regarding the uh, Building Canada Fund for national significance, the Yellowhead, is it already considered a, a road of national significance? Um, it, it's, it's a core highway within the national highway system. Um, uh, we're, what we are trying to do is sort of move it up a notch. Um, to be more competitive with the Trans-Canada number one. Uh, heretofore, the Trans-Canada number one has been getting a fair amount of investment, both at provincial and federal level. Uh, we sort of want to uh, even up the game a bit, so that's, that's our objective. Okay, and I'll talk to administration about uh, projects we might be able to apply under that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from committee or council members? No, uh, absolutely none. If we, if we want, we will ask. Um, but uh, uh, we certainly have the representative from the city on our committee, and she will guide the way, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Okay, move it. So we have a, something we can, Councillor Esslinger can move. Do we want to wait for administration to come back? Let's go wait for administration. Okay. I think we should. Okay. So thank you, and we can have administration uh, come back. Thank you for your patience again. Hopefully it was an enjoyable day, nonetheless. I've done it before. Thank you, sir.
Councillor Esslinger, you want to? Well, we should ask questions of administration first. Would that be appropriate, yes, sir? Thank you. You're up first. All right. Um, we we're just chatting. Um, what would be the cost, or do we have an idea of the cost for us to upgrade the Yellowhead through Edmonton at this time? Uh, Councillor Esslinger, um, we have uh, an approximate cost to do the work over the next 15 years of about $1.1 billion. That's to create interchanges at four locations. Okay, and of that total package, these guys' jaws are dropping. Um, <laughs> how, what, do we have a number of projects? Would, if we had money tomorrow, would we have projects ready to go? Uh, attachment two of your report documents uh, or summarizes the various projects or stages that we outlined in previous reports to this committee um, and where they are at in terms of design. Um, stage one is a series of intersection improvements that uh, aim to remove uh, intersections and s traffic signals off of Yellowhead Trail. That is, uh, we have concept planning done on that and we're we're waiting for capital funding to do that work. So it's not quite shovel ready, but it's uh, probably a year's worth of design that needs to get done and then uh, a year or two of construction. The so others that follow stage two through five are various interchanges. 149th Street um, interchange. Uh, we've been at committee before just to update you and <laughs> We're nearing completion of that concept plan and we anticipate we'll be back in front of committee uh, for approval of that plan probably in the early fall, September I would think. And then the other projects, stage three, four and five are our next ones on our list. Uh, backing up to 149th Street, um, we may be done a concept plan in September. The next stage of design comes uh, after capital budgets have been approved. Um, certainly there's a profile put forward as part of the capital budget for the fall and it depends on the priorities of council at the time. Okay, and, um, and just moving forward, we have a motion. Do, is, do we have other questions, I guess, before I do that motion? Uh, no other questions. So we can move it. <coughs> so I'm happy to move the motion. <coughs> that administration provide a report to transportation committee identifying portions of the city's Yellowhead Trail that are shovel ready, which probably be your phase one group, for which we can apply for, national, for the national component of the Building Canada Fund. So we want to be ready to take advantage of any opportunities that might exist through that program. Comments? It's just information. Do you have comments, sir? Well, I think when I asked for shovel ready, he indicated phase one. So say shovel ready, I, I interpret it as phase one. Would the administration interpret shovel ready as your maybe, phase maybe one? we should say phase one sure. because we wouldn't go into any kind of design phase without having uh, the funding in place. Okay. So if, with that, okay. well, okay. you're comfortable with that, Councillor? Absolutely. Okay. Any questions or anyone wishing to speak to it? Please say now. Okay. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. I move we extend orders of the day to complete the next item. Thank you. Whoops. All we've, got two. we've got two, right? Two. 30 minutes? Sure. Extend, uh, so the motion is to extend orders of the day for 30 minutes to complete the next two items. Those in favor? Oh. 30 minutes or to complete. Or to complete. 
We'll just move to extend orders of the day. And then we'll... Do we need a time limit, Madam Clerk? You don't need a time limit. We'll come back to it at 6 o'clock. Okay. If we Thank need you. to. I don't think we will. We won't. So we are up now. We are going to do 7.1 uh, before 6.6 because .6, the speaker has been here. Sorry, Mr. Seabrook. I should have I should have mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Champion, if you could please come forward and speak to 7.1. And thank you, Mr. Seabrook, for your patience. So your time is whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the Transportation Committee, uh, I just became aware of the parking issue yesterday evening, so I apologize for the lack of a written uh, presentation. Uh, the report, while it does illustrate the lack of parking in Central McDougall and Queen Mary Park, it seemed to me to be a bit vague and somewhat amorphous. <clears throat> so hopefully I can add some color to the report. In 206, Associated Engineering <coughs> completed the 105th Avenue corridor study with a recommendation for a parking study and a possible parking regimen in the above two communities. In Central McDougall, the northern half of the community is inundated by the parking from the Royal <coughs> Alex complex to 11 p.m. in the RCMP and professional building until 6 p.m. <coughs> Vacant lots need to be literally fenced off to prevent <coughs> non-accessory parking. Remember, parts of 104 Street and 105 Street are no longer available for parking due to LRT. <clears throat> the southern half of Central McDougall is, again, inundated by Grant McEwen parking and to a large degree in summer is also <clears throat> uh, used by downtown workers who park and walk to work. Grant McEwen is an issue until 9 p.m. while downtown parking ends at 5.30 p.m. Literally, there is no parking in most of the community until later in the evening. Further exacerbating the issue is the fact that parking on 105 Avenue from 101 to 116th Street will be banned as part of the development of the 105 Avenue corridor precinct, uh, <coughs> 105 Avenue corridor uh, at the precinct C in Central McDougall has the second most density in Edmonton next to downtown. The high-rise district will create a high-density development that will rem remove parking generally from the north edge. 107th Avenue is already rated at maximum capacity by the Transportation Department before future development becomes part of the urban reality. Remember, the population of the north edge will eventually double. This will dramatically increase traffic and parking demand in the community, irrespective of LRT. Where will all of these vehicles go? Finally, the infrastructure now being constructed, the arena, the museum, <clears throat> and potentially the Galleria are the real elephants in the room. This is a quick, simplistic, and reductive summary of living in a parking lot right now. As development begins, things will get significantly worse. During the day, if I move my vehicle, I lose a parking lot in front of my house. Our large and very expensive community park is surrounded by vehicles Eliminating, park, uh, eliminating parking for park users. It should be noted that several large gravel parking lots do not have development permits. These lots are in the southern part of the community and with their demise will dramatically increase parking demand <coughs> on the adjacent streets. Again, it should be noted that the new DC-1, that's Precinct C, does not uh, allow non-accessory parking. We need to quickly start a parking study and introduce an appropriate parking regimen. It would be nice to do this before all parking is used. Finally, no community should be a parking lot for non-residents. Other communities would not tolerate uh, <coughs> the existing situation. And I'm not sure how much time I have looking at it. I'm still green. I would suggest that the Royal Alex Complex is the second largest employer in Edmonton, next to the university, that with the existing situation, if you look at the area surrounding the university or a couple of such areas, 
principally that area, they have a parking regimen. We meant to come down and deal with this issue, but I did a, uh, a study over a uh, application on 107th Avenue. So I went one block south, one block north, one block east, one block west at 1.30 in the afternoon. There was one parking spot in that whole area. So at some point in time, we need to do something. And I'm also suggesting to you that, you know, <clears throat> Central McDougal and to a lesser degree, but a very significant degree, Queen Mary Park, you know, we've been kind of abandoned for about 40, 45 years. It would be nice if people actually started investing in the community and started doing things that would actually be constructive. And I just want to take the time to remind you that outside of the airport, the largest potential urban village in Edmonton happens to be in the broader north edge. So there's a lot of potential there. It just hasn't been realized. Uh, I'm watching that light. I'm also, having read the... Uh, 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 instructions, it would be really difficult for us to get two-thirds approval of the community uh, to move forward on this. I mean, 85, 88 percent of our community rents. You know, it's a problem. So if you could find a way to approve this, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Champion. Questions from committee? Uh, I don't have a question. Uh, Mr. Champion, I just wanted to thank you for coming down and to giving the community perspective, which I've heard many times. So I appreciate it. And if you'd come in under the five minutes, we would have all been shocked. But, you know, the thanks for filling that. Anyways, thank you very much, Mr. Champion, for coming in. Sure, I actually did. I, I wrote this <laughs> while I was listening to counsel, so it was not exactly articulate. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Okay, any other questions from committee or should we call up administration? Thank you, Mr. Champion. Appreciate it. Could we get a motion to move 7.1 forward? Yes. Oh, thank you. So you should probably tell me that four or five more times. Can we move 7.1 forward? Is committee comfortable with that, please? So moved. Thank you. All in favor? No. We must uh, turn back time. Yeah, yeah. He gets five more minutes. Okay, uh, questions from committee on this? Okay, Councillor Esslinger, and then we'll go to. Thank you, and I heard the comment of the challenge of getting uh, two thirds of the community to sign on to the residential parking plan. Has that been a challenge in other locations as well? Way more hassle. Uh, Councillor Esslinger. It's, it hasn't been a significant challenge in other areas. Usually in areas where there's been a request for uh, a residential parking program, the uh, support has been and, and desire has been pretty, uh, pretty widespread throughout the community. So typically it, it does move forward fairly quickly, um, provided that uh, the area does uh, warrant it according to the guidelines. Has there been any communities that have been unable, that are interested but unable to get to two-thirds? Um, not recently, uh, you know, I'd have to dig back to see, but we, in, I guess one of the, the challenges with the residential park programs is they do typically result from some type of uh, traffic generator. So there haven't been uh, a lot of new ones lately. We've had expansions of existing programs, but certainly as the arena comes forward, we'll be looking at that area because that will definitely be a new traffic generator. I've heard concerns also along... Uh Near the Nate LRT when it finally opens, there could be concerns in Westwood. So we may have a few others. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKean. Thank you very much. Um, this, um, well, I, I'll just say that I've, heard, I've had a lot of concerns raised, Central McDougal, Queen Mary Park, and Oliver, with all the institutions that have been mentioned and the, and the free parking on residential streets from those institutions. But it also came up because we, we've just approved, council just approved a 28 story tower in Oliver where the streets are quite congested. My question is this, so we've had a sort of a cursory look. Uh, and, and rather than going jumping to a program, is there a mid-step here? Do we do a study? Do, is, that a, is that a something we would 
normally do. We would look at it more in depth in the sense of what is the, what's, what is the situation out there on the streets? Secondly, what might be done to alleviate some of the concerns? Is that something we have done, could do in this case? Uh, Councillor McKean, we have done some studies in the last uh, two years with respect to parking inventory. And certainly as the arena move forward, there's a piece of work that's going to take place around that. Uh, the key would be to look at those two pieces of work and tie them together. And then also, um, I think on a location by location basis, as the report identified, there are some tools that we can address uh, or use to address immediate concerns. But on a bigger, a bigger picture, we would need to, to try and keep in simple terms, we would need to look at it uh, with all of those different traffic generators or parking traffic generators and then tie them together. So you got the K division, you got the Royal Alex, you got the McEwen, and then you've got all the, um, all the businesses downtown and in Oliver that are generating uh, a lot of trips downtown, people use, and, and in these areas using these streets. Help me out here because I don't want this to just be received for information. What would be a good next step to, to give some satisfaction to the neighborhoods that we want to look at this. We're going to, you know, you know, arena or not, I think we need to be looking at this, and I know the arena will look, probably look at the, will tie in Central McDougal, perhaps Queen Mary Park, but I, I don't want Oliver forgotten either. So, um, and, I, and I, don't you think that these, these issues kind of fit within our broader transportation goals here too of, I mean, um, uh, in, in regards to uh, enticing people onto transit, onto LRT, these sorts of things, and where the, the idea of communities being used as free parking lots uh, somehow just seems uh, offside to me. So what, what would be, what could we do next steps here? So, Councillor, in, in terms of what we could do quickly to move forward is we've got those, the, the bigger picture things going on, but we could certainly uh, engage some of the communities and, and meet with them to see what some of those parking issues are and look for some quick, uh, quicker solutions in, ter in terms of getting some... So a motion uh, directing administration to meet with those three communities? We could do that without a motion. Okay, but I'd sort of like a report back, that's all I'm... And I, and I, I don't need to make a motion if, we, if, if you will report back somehow, but... We, we can do that. We are coming forward in, um, in June with, uh, or July with an update to our parking management study. That would be a little bit sooner, but certainly we could come back uh, in, in August or September with, with a report, with an update in terms of where we've progressed. You don't need a motion? No, we wouldn't need a motion. Because I'm not on the committee. I can't really make a motion, so I'll... Uh, well, I, if, if I could speak to the non-motion. <laughs> you have uh, a 30 couple, seconds. A few seconds left for some don't yeah, you think. Yeah, no, I just. For some don't you thinks. And I, I, you know, I think uh, um, Councillor Anderson wanted to whip me upside the head here or something on this because I know there are issues. I know there are unintended consequences of, uh, of bans and things and meters. And, but I really think to, uh, I think there's, especially in the case of Central McDougall and Queen Mary Park, it's, it's sending a message to those communities that we're not going to use them as parking lots. That they, we, we see them as a lot more valuable than that, and we see their potential as being a lot higher than that. And I think it's, it not only sends a message to them, it sends a message, message to the entire community. These are communities on the way up, and we have a lot of respect for them, and we want to see them revitalized. So I, I think there's a number of issues here, and I frankly uh, think that we're spending billions of dollars on, on, on LRT and transit, and, and that we need, to, we need to put our money where our mouth is here and say to those people, you know what? We've, we've spent this money over here. We're not going to allow you to park for free wherever you want. Don't you think? Don't you think? Uh, I don't think it's good enough not to have a motion, and I'm going to move that the administration meet with the three affected communities and uh, bring back a report. Uh, at, at, I don't want to make it specific, because if you need time, you take time. Issues and options. 
parking issues and options and report back to Transportation Committee when, when your task is done. So, Councillor, that motion on the screen, is it to your satisfaction? Will you look at that, Councillor Henderson? Well, just, yes. I, I, I just want to do some double check on this because I've been through this in East Garno and I, and I just want to ask some questions because I think I, I would like to know if we're going to go down this road and I think Mr. Champion's point is well taken that some creativity is going to be necessary because correct me if I'm wrong because this is what scuppered it in East Garno despite the fact the majority of single family residences wanted it that in actual fact if we go to a parking permit program none of the people in the walk-ups will get those permits and they're the people that therefore will not be keen to see this happen and will vote against it. So, and most, most of the area that we're talking about here is exactly those kind of properties. So unless we're creative about what we do with this, it's going to fail and it will not achieve our ends. So I, as a kind of caution, I think we need, if we're going to go down this road, I think some creativity that paints the, the, the colors outside the lines of our existing policy is going to be necessary in order to achieve something here or we're not going to get where we want to go. So that, is that but, possible? But that conversation is going to happen when this report Well, can I get the back. answer from these guys? So, Councillor, the motion there uh, would allow us to identify, again, the issues and options. It won't, def won't necessarily define the solutions, but will provide us with an opportunity for discussion around what the options are. And if, if the current tools that we have don't meet what we see, uh, as issues, then we would have to look at other options, and, and that's when we would debate. So that. you, this would let you bring back some options that are outside our current policy, because I think that's what you're going to have to do. That motion would allow that to be okay, done. Okay, great, thanks. Good, thank you. So, all in favor of the motion on the screen? Motion carried. And so do we need to receive 7.1 for information? No. So, so moved. So moved. And the clerk says yes. So it was a, was it? It was an action, it was an action motion, so we don't need to receive it for information. Okay. okay. Say subsequent on the screen, but we'll just pretend that it didn't say that. Oh, you did take it off? Okay. Who this chairing committee business. It's been a great day, learning a lot. The city hasn't fallen apart yet. The 6.6, um, we do not need a presentation. Councillor Escalier had a question. Thank you, this really talks about the scope change and the fact that we're gonna fund it over two capital plans. I wanna know, has the dollar amount of the scope changed or is it just a funding model change? Uh, Councillor Esslinger, the scope of the project definitely changed since uh, it was initially approved at the start of the budget cycle. So the scope now uh, is such that the project is being done over two years. Phase one was contained within the 2011 to 14 budget cycle or 12 to 14 budget cycle and phase two will be in the 15 to 18 budget cycle and that's a separate uh, uh, budget process. So how much was phase one? Phase one was just under Five million, uh, I believe it was 4.9. And what is we looking at for phase two? Do you have a sense yet? Uh, phase two uh, is just over seven million, I believe. Okay, so my follow-up question then is, then why did the scope change to double the original project? Two things happened as part of the scope change. First, the project was initially a reconstruction a project that went from 50th to 60th Street and the scope was expanded to go from 60th to 68th Street and that resulted in a lot of, or resulted from some of the discussions and interaction with the uh, Community League along 112 Avenue and the uh, process that uh, Mrs. Tui referred to earlier. So as part of that process, uh, both the length of the, the uh, area that was being addressed was expanded as well as the elements within the project. Thank you. I'm always concerned about scope creep. Thank you very much. Do you want to ask that question? Yeah. I'll ask. So the, in, the, in the Capital Amendment 39, it talks about $20 million. And you said? You said five. 
So the initial amendment that was made as part of the budget, uh, this budget cycle, was for $20 million, and it was to address three specific locations that are identified in the report. And that was based on some initial assessments. The uh, 63rd Avenue project uh, was initially identified at $5 million, and the actual value was, uh, I believe, 11 or $12 million. And then the uh, project for uh, 112 Avenue went significantly uh, higher as well due to the ch uh, change in scope. And what that meant was that the $20 million that was added in the project or in the profile didn't allow for 127th Street to be uh, completed in this budget cycle. So that was deferred to the 15 to 18 budget cycle. Okay. I got you. Thank you. Uh, for information. information. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. All in favor? Okay. That motion is carried. Any notices of motions? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.